Chapter Eighteen of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen: The Siege of Paris Continued with the Besieged, eighteen seventy, eighteen seventy one. Moods in Paris: The Empress Escapes, Taking Down Imperial Flags, Playing Dominoes Under Fire, Cowards Branded, Balloon Post, Return of the Wounded french numbed by cold the lady and the dogs the nurse who was mighty particular castor and pollux pronounced tough stories of suffering one who was in paris on the third of september eighteen seventy might have heard strange things said in the cafes as evening came on the french had suffered a great disaster they had surrendered to the germans at sedan mcmahon was wounded and taken prisoner the emperor had given himself up and was going to germany as a first-class prisoner eighty thousand men captured and two hundred guns was not that news enough to sell every paper in the street shouts were heard of déchéance vive la république where was the poor empress all this time never mind her it was she who had stirred up the emperor napoleon the third to make this horrible war so the papers print cruel caricatures of her on sunday the fourth very early in the morning a huge crowd thronged the place de la concorde men were pulling down imperial eagles while the mob cheered the regular soldiers met the national guard and made friends men said to one another what will become of the empress will she fall a victim to the new patriots and whilst some wondered a few friends were even then helping her to escape to england everywhere on walls of houses were bills fixed announcing the republic and inviting all men to rally to the rescue of la patrie en danger but the railway stations were very full of men women and children who were trying to get a little country air could it be possible that they feared paris might before long be besieged drums and bugles incessant uniforms always rifles and sidearms very often men stood before the black draped statue of strasbourg and waved arms wildly shouting and screaming revenge liberty and the like by the tenth of the month the prussian forces three hundred thousand strong were about twenty-five miles from the capital people began to look grave and the more thoughtful went to the stores and made secret purchases of coffee rice sugar and other portable provisions still the parisians have not lost their gaiety yet comic songs and punchinello evoke hilarious laughter then came the news versailles has honorably capitulated what so near as that people are becoming nervous so that the new authorities proclaim by bill posters that the fifteen strong forts beyond the line of ramparts are fully armed and manned by the sailors from the fleet a captive balloon goes up from montmartre to watch the enemy then it occurs that obstacles outside the city must be cleared away so that the chasse po may have space to reach the prussians and many houses and bridges go down well if there is a siege have we not got a goodly store of food enough for two months are there not plenty of cattle and sheep fodder and grain collected within the walls who cares for the prussians yet when they see notices posted on the walls instructing the newly enrolled how to load their muskets some have a twinge of doubt and anxiety a few days more and paris begins to feel she is being encircled by the enemy great movements of troops towards vincennes official notices now state that all men liable to military service must report themselves within twenty-four hours under penalty of being treated as deserters and shot yet still many are placidly playing dominoes or calmly fishing from the bridges in the seine quite content if they catch a gudgeon two inches long yet if some are betraying levity and selfishness others are filled with a desire to do something for their country the doctors offer their services in a body and hospitals for the wounded are being established at various points ladies wearing a brassade on the arm the red cross badge were almost too numerous and some of these had more zeal than strength and failed lamentably when brought face to face with horrible sights 
on the nineteenth of september some french forces who occupied the heights of chatillon were attacked in force by the germans and driven away and they ran through paris crying we are betrayed but the people gloomily replied cowards the next day many of these fugitives were marched along the boulevards their hands tied behind their backs and the word lache coward printed in large letters between their shoulders yet still crowds of men in uniform and ladies fashionably dressed crowded the cafés laughing and full of mirth as the bombardment grew it became the fashion to gather at the trocadero and watch the prussian shells exploding in mid-air the village folk who had lived within the lines of investment were brought inside the ramparts and formed a class of bouche inutile though some of the men were employed to cut down trees and build barricades the palace of st cloud was burnt down about this time some said by the french themselves either by accident or design a post by balloon and by carrier pigeons had been introduced par ballon monté by which letters were sent away but could not be received in the middle of october colonel lloyd lindsay arrived from england bringing with him twenty thousand pounds as a gift from england to the sick and wounded he came into paris in the uniform of his rank this did not prevent his being captured as a spy and suffering some indignities at the hands of the great unwashed of belleville some with questionable taste said the english send us money all right but why do they not help us with men and guns the governor of paris was thought to be rather infirm of purpose his sympathies were given more to napoleon than to the republic and he evidently distrusted the fighting men within paris indeed there were many officers quite unfit for work who used to lounge about the cafés their hands buried in warm muff and their noses red with the little glasses they had emptied many battalions of federals elected their own officers and some men were seen to be soliciting votes bottle in hand the national guard which was somewhat like our militia was distinct from the french army and contained many bad characters they were apt to desert in time of danger on the twenty first of october there was a sortie against the prussians on the west of paris they started at noon as mount valerian fired three guns in quick succession they took with them some new guns called mitrailleuse from which great things were expected in the evening there came back a long procession of sixty-four carriages all filled with wounded crowds of anxious mothers came clustering round inquiring for friends the people in the street formed two lines for the carriages to pass between the men respectfully uncovered their heads november came with snow and bitter frost strange skins of animals began to be worn fuel was scarce gas was forbidden and epidemics arose the very poor received free meals from the marys while the more respectable poor stayed at home making no sign but starving in dumb agony on the thirtieth of november another sortie was attempted some villages were taken by the french champigny and brie the mitrailleuse being found very useful in sweeping the streets but towards evening the french were repulsed and the commander of the fourth zouaves was left by his own men on the ground wounded a shell having dropped near them fortunately the english ambulance was close by and rendered such help as was possible then they drove the helpless officer in a private brougham back to paris what was their indignation when they found great crowds of people of both sexes indulging in noisy games as if it was a holiday the poor chef de bataillon only lived a few hours after being taken to the hospital next day ambulances were sent out to search for the wounded but they came upon many stragglers bent on loot the wounded were in sore plight after spending a night on the frozen ground some had been able to make a little fire out of bits of broken wheels and to roast horse flesh cut from horses which the shells had killed the french troops had remained in bivouac all that night their strength impaired by fatigue and cold the german troops on the contrary were withdrawn from the field of battle their places being taken by others who had not seen the carnage of the previous day who were well fed and sheltered and thus far better fitted to renew the fight 
no wonder that the poor benumbed french failed to make a stout resistance hundreds of wounded returned to paris all the following day and it became evident that no effort to break the circle of besiegers could succeed paris awoke at last to the humiliating truth the day was cold and foggy the transport of wounded was the only sound heard in the streets in the evening the streets were dimly lit by oil lamps shops all closed at sundown and the boom of heavy guns seemed to ring the knell of doom all hope was now fixed on the provinces but a pigeon post came in telling them of a defeat near orleans the army of the loire has been cut in two tant mieux so much the better now we have two armies of the loire so the dandy of the pavement dismissed the disasters with an epigram the scarcity of meat was felt in various ways even the rich found it difficult to smuggle a joint into their houses for it was liable to arrest on its way some patriots could take it from a cart or the shoulder of the butcher's boy saying "Sieur, this aristocrat is going to have more than his share one day a fashionable lady was returning home carrying a parasol and a neat parcel under her shawl after her came six hungry dogs who could not be persuaded to go home though she hissed and scolded and poked them with her gay parasol on meeting a friend she first asked him to drive them away and then confided to him that she had two pounds of mutton in her parcel and so the poor dogs got none amongst the hungry folk we must not forget that there were nearly four thousand english in paris about eight hundred of whom were destitute and would have starved had it not been for the kindness of dr herbert and mr wallace the wounded were well looked after for there were two hundred and forty three ambulances of which the largest the international had its headquarters at the grand hotel in one of the paris journals it was stated that a lady went to the mayor's house of her district to ask to be given a wounded soldier that she might nurse him back to life they offered her a zouave small and swarthy no no she exclaimed i wish for a blonde patient being a brunette myself it was hardly worth while going to pay a visit to the zoological gardens for most of the animals had been eaten castor and pollux were amongst the last to render up their bodies for this service castor and pollux were two very popular elephants on whose backs half the boys and girls in paris had taken afternoon excursions poor fellows they were pronounced later on by the critical to be tough and oily to such lengths can human ingratitude go when mutton is abundant they were twins and inseparable in life their trunks were sold for forty-five francs a pound the residue for about ten francs a pound besides the loss of the animals all the glass of the conservatories in the jardin des plans was shattered by the concussion of the big guns and many valuable tropical plants were dying the citizens usually so gay and hopeful presented a woebegone appearance whenever they saw their soldiers return from unsuccessful sorties they began to look about for traitors nous sommes trahis was their cry there was one private of the hundred and nineteenth battalion who refused to advance with the others his captain remonstrated with him the private shot his captain rather than face the germans a general who was near ordered the private to be shot at once a file was drawn up and fired on him he fell and was left for dead presently an ambulance stretcher came by and picked him up as a wounded man he was still alive and had to be dealt with further by other of his comrades let us hope that this man's relations never learnt how jacques came to be so riddled by bullets the houses on the left bank of the seine were so damaged that the citizens had to be transferred to the right bank in a few days the terrible battery of moudon opened fire upon the city the shells now fell near to the centre of paris day and night without rest or stay the pitiless hail fell and this went on for twelve days and nights meanwhile the cold increased and the fuel failed diseases spread and discontent with the government arose women waiting in the streets for their rations would fall from exhaustion others were mangled by shells the daily ration for which the poor creatures struggled consisted now of ten ounces of bread one ounce of horse flesh and a quarter litre of bad wine one more effort the starving parisians made to break through on the nineteenth of january 
early that morning people were reading the latest proclamation on the walls citizens the enemy kills our wives and children bombards us night and day covers with shells our hospitals those who can shed their life's blood on the field of battle will march against the enemy suffer and die if necessary but conquer three corps d'armee more than a hundred thousand men were taking up their positions under cover of mont valerien but a dense fog prevailed and several hours were lost in wandering aimlessly about so that the french became worn out with fatigue whereas the germans had passed a quiet night with good food to sustain their strength yet for many hours the french obstinately held their ground then stragglers began to fall away and officers tried in vain to rally their companies night fell on a beaten army hurrying back through the city gates meanwhile the bombardment went on with increasing violence until early on the night of the twenty sixth there was a sudden lull just before midnight a volley of fire came from all points of the circle round paris then a weird silence then it was known that the terms of surrender had been signed not too soon for all were at starvation point and only six days rations remained paris had been very patient under great sufferings through the cold winter it is pleasant to remember that supplies of food sent from england were then waiting admission outside the northern gates an english doctor residing in paris during the siege writes thus one lady to whom i carried a fowl was prostrate in bed her physical powers reduced by starvation to an extremely low ebb when i told her that she was simply dying from want of food her reply was that she really had no appetite she could not eat anything yet when i gave her some savoury morsel to be taken at once and then the fowl to be cooked later on her face brightened she half raised herself in bed and pressed the little articles i had brought to her as a child presses a doll i was told also that the nurses in an ambulance which i had aided with the british supplies danced round the tables and invoked blessings on our heads as regards myself what i most craved for was fried fat bacon and fruit and above all apples besides the wild animals of the french zoological gardens most of the domestic pets had been eaten a story is told of one french lady who carefully guarded her little dog fido feeding him from her own plate with great self-sacrifice one day the family had the rare treat of a hot joint and in the middle of dinner the lady took up a small bone to carry to fido in the next room she returned in trouble saying fido is not in the house he would so have enjoyed this bone i hope he has not got out they will kill him the brutes and eat him the members of that starving family exchanged uneasy glances they were even now engaged upon a salmille or hash formed from a portion of the lady's pet from memoirs of dr gordon by kind permission of measures swan sonnenschein and company End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen metz eighteen seventy metz surrounded taken for a spy work with an ambulance fierce prussians rob an old woman attempt to leave metz refusing an honor the cantinier's horse the gray pet of the regiment deserters abound a village fired for punishment sad scenes at the end one englishman the special correspondent of the manchester guardian contrived to enter metz shortly before it was besieged but he had not been there long before a disagreeable experience befell him he was riding quietly outside the city towards the french camps which were pitched all around it when suddenly a soldier stepped across the road and cried halt two men seized his reins asking have you any papers yes here is my passport he replied confidently the passport puzzled them it was taken to a superior officer who knew that it was english but looked suspiciously at the german visa which it bears the englishman was taken to a general across the road who shook his head and remanded him to another officer of the staff a mile back towards metz 
it begins to look serious this man may be shot as a spy two gendarmes were called up to guard him soldiers came up to stare with savage scowls he was a spy undoubtedly but cigarettes were offered by the spy and things began to look less cloudy then up came general burbaki and fresh questions were put and answered then a mounted messenger was sent to metz to find out if the prisoner's statements were correct on his return with a satisfactory account the prisoner was told to mount and ride with escort to the headquarters of the commander-in-chief marshal bazaine as he rode soldiers jeered and prophesied a speedy death in a ditch which made him feel ill at ease a ride of a mile brought him to a pretty chateau where he was received with courtesy and kindness at a long common deal-table in a wooden pavilion in the garden sat the marshal and some twenty officers of the staff dispatches were being written signed and sent off by mounted messengers in the corner was an electric telegraph ticking off reports from distant points when the conference broke up marshal bazaine motioned the suspect to a seat and questioned him made him show on a map where he had been riding found he understood no german and was a fool at maps perhaps a little stupidity was put on then he left him to his secretary the latter said with a sly glance we have so many spies that we are bound to be careful but the arrest in this case is a stupid thing une bataise i will give you a laissez passer for the day monsieur so he went off relieved at not being shot for a spy but somewhat mortified there was hard fighting going on in the country round metz our countrymen managed to get attached to an ambulance and went on to a battlefield at night we lit our lanterns he says and went cautiously into the valley there were prussian sharpshooters in the wood beyond and i confess i was very nervous at first the still night the errand we were on all odd one but so soon as we reached the outskirts of the battlefield all personal feelings gave way to others here at every turn we found our aid was wanted thousands of dead and wounded were around us and we a few strangers sent by the international society of london were all that were present to help them plugging and bandaging such wounds as were hopeful of cure giving a life-saving drink here and there moving a broken limb into a more easy position and speaking a word of encouragement where the heart was failing this was all we could do but all that night each worked his utmost and when our water failed two of us walked back four miles to gravelotte and brought a bucketful we can dress but not remove the wounded now often have i been tempted to put a poor fellow out of his pain it seems kinder wiser and more christian to blow out the flickering lamp than let it smoulder away in hours of anguish daylight begins to dawn and we seek carriages that is jolting unhung carts to convey some of the wounded now as we raise them up and torture their poor wounds by moving them for the first time we hear a cry the groans of the dying the shrieks of the wounded are absent from the battlefield but far more dreadful and awe-inspiring is the awful stillness of that battlefield at night there is a low quivering moan floats over it nothing more it is a sound almost too deep for utterance and it thrills through one with a strange horror hardly a word is uttered save only a half wailed out cry of oe ma pauvre mère nothing is more touching nothing fills one's eyes with tears more than this plaintive refrain chanted out as a death chant by so many sons who never more on this side of the grave will see again that longed-for mother oe ma mère ma pauvre mère we select sixty or seventy of those whose wounds will bear removal and turn our faces towards metz slowly and sadly we creep out of the death valley the quaint hooded forms of the sentinels who challenge us cut out strangely against the green and gold of the morning sky not a walking stick not a pipe is left us they were cut up into tourniquet keys i am ashamed to say i regretted my pipe but it came back to me after many weeks being brought to me by a man whose life it had saved very grateful he was as we toil upwards musing on life and death bang right in our very faces spits out a cannon 
good heavens they surely are not going to begin this devil's work again yes there goes a battery to the crest of the hill we must take care of ourselves and those we have so far rescued from slaughter on we tramp but there is no food not a crust of bread not a drop of water for our wounded it is nine miles more back to metz and tired as we are we must walk it very tired and hungry and cross we enter metz and there see the french ambulances waiting with wagon loads of appliances and well-groomed horses they had stopped to breakfast and many hundreds have died because they did so well we have earned ours at any rate it was now the twenty eighth of august metz was blockaded no letters could be sent for the german hosts were holding the heights all round ruthless rough riders were riding into every french village in one of these the story goes a poor old woman was washing her little store of linen she was very old and her gray hair spouted in silver tufts from her yellow skin all the rest had fled in panic she alone was left busy at her tub when up rode some score of huge dragoons they pulled up in front of her speaking their barbarous tongue one dragoon dismounts and draws his sword poor old woman she falls upon her knees and lifts up wrinkled hands and cries feebly for mercy it is in vain neither age nor ugliness protects her raising his sword with one hand he stretches out the other towards her the prussian monster and grasps her soap he quietly cuts it in two pockets the one half and replaces the other on the well wall growling out madame pardon the reaction was too great when they rode away laughing the old woman forgot to be thankful that they had not hurt her and swore at them for hairy thieves on the fifteenth of september there were around metz a hundred and thirty eight thousand men fit to take the field six cavalry and artillery the prussians had not anything like that number they were dying fast of dysentery and fever and yet bazaine did nothing yet though metz was not strongly held it was very difficult to get through the lines and many a man tempted by the bride of a thousand francs lost his life in the attempt the English journalist tried to be his own courier and carry his own letters. He presented himself at the Prussian outposts in daylight, showed his passport, and demanded permission to pass freely without let or hindrance. In vain, the German soldiers treated him to beer and cigars and suggested he should return to Metz. Next time he dressed himself up as a peasant, with blouse and sabots on his feet, and when it was growing dusk tried to slip through the posts. Halte la rang out and a sound of a rifle clicks brought him up sharp he was a prisoner taken to the guardhouse and questioned severely he pretended to be very weak-headed almost an idiot how many soldiers be there in metz master i don't know maybe three hundred there are power of men walking about the street sir they smiled a superior smile and offered the poor idiot some dark rye bread cheese and beer and some clean straw to lie down upon officers came to stare at him asked him what village he was bound for one of them knew the village he named and recognized his description of it for luckily he had got up this local knowledge from a native in metz however he was not permitted to go to it for before dawn next morning they led him shuffling in his wooden sabots to a distant outpost turned his face towards metz with the curt remark go straight on to metz friend or you will feel a bullet go through your back grumbling to himself he drew near the french outpost who fired at him he lay down for some time then finding he was in a potato field he set to work and grubbed up a few potatoes to sell for a sou apiece so at last he found his way back to metz and got well laughed at for his pains he then tried his hand at making small balloons to carry his letters away but the germans used to fire at them wing them and read the contents many spies were shot in metz and some who were not spies but only suspected it was the only excitement in the city to go out to the fosse and see a spy shot there was one man whom all raised their hats to salute when he passed he was a short thick-set man wore a light canvas jacket and leather gaiters under one arm hung a large game bag and over the other sloped a chasse rifle 
his name was hitter and he had made a great name by going out in front of the avant poste and shooting the prussian sentinels one night he encountered some wagons shot down the escort from his hiding place and brought four wagons full of corn into metz riding on the box by the driver pistol in hand this man organized a body of sharpshooters for night work and many a poor sentinel met his death at their hands one favorite dodge was to take out with them a tin can fastened to a long string when they got near the prussian outposts they made this go tingle tangle along the ground then cautious heads would peep out more tangle tingle from the tin can until the sentinels jump up and blaze away at the weird thing that startles them in the dark their fire has been drawn and hitter's men have the outpost at their mercy they either shoot them or bring them into metz as prisoners at length marshal bazaine heard of hitter's prowess and sent for him wanting to decorate him but hitter was sensitive and thought he ought to have been decorated weeks ago he came reluctantly my man i have heard of your doings your clever work at night and in the name of france i give you this decoration to wear i don't want it marshal pray excuse me if you please nonsense my fine fellow i insist on your acceptance of the honour oh very well said hitter if you insist i suppose i must but by your leave i shall wear it on my back and very low down too the marshal glared at hitter turned red and ordered him out as the siege went on the poor horses got thinner and thinner their coats stood out in the wet weather rough and bristly often they staggered and fell dead in the streets they were soon set upon and in a short time flesh bones and hide had vanished and only a little pool of blood remained behind to tell where some hungry citizens had snatched a good dinner one day a cantinière had left her cart full of drinkables just outside the gate while she went to the fort to ask what was wanted she tarried and her poor horse felt faint knelt down and tried to die no sooner was the poor beast on his knees than half a score of soldiers rushed out to save his life by cutting his throat at least it made him eat better they quickly slipped off his skin and cut him up in all haste so many knives were e'en at him they soon carried off his meat then in a merry mood seeing the gay cantinière was too busy flirting to attend to her cart they carefully set to work and built him up again they put the bones together neatly dragged the hide over the carcass and arranged the harness to look as if the animal had lain down between the shafts then they retired to watch the comedy that sprang out of a tragedy madame comes bustling out of the fort ah what's that poor adolphe is down on the ground the fat woman waddles faster to him calls him by name taunts him with want of pluck scolds gets out her whip then is dumb for some seconds touches him cries weeps wrings her hands in despair sounds of laughter come to her ears then she rises majestically to the occasion pours out a volley of oaths oaths of many syllables oaths that tax a genius in arithmetic diable cent diable mille diable cent mille diable and so on until she loses her breath puts her fat hand to her heart and again falls into a pathetic mood passes later on into hysteria and being led away between two gendarmes poor madame she had loved adolphe and would have eaten him in her own home circle rather than those sacre soldiers should filch him away well they ate horses when they could get them but donkeys were even more delicious though very rare for they seldom died and refused to get fat food was growing so scarce in october that when you went out to dinner you were expected to take your own bread with you potatoes were sold at fifteen pence a pound a scraggly fowl might be bought for thirty shillings the prussians had spread nets across the river above and below to prevent the french from catching too many fish as for sugar it rose to seven shillings a pound salt was almost beyond price the poor horses looked most woebegone many of them were arabs their bones nearly through their skin 
and they looked at their friends with such a pitiful appealing eye that it was most touching you might have gone into a trooper's tent and wondered to see the big tear rolling slowly down the bronzed cheek of a brave soldier what is it monsieur i have just lost my best friend my best friend he was with me in algeria never tumbled never went lame and he understood me better than any christian he would have done anything for me in reason now he has had to go to the slaughter-house oh it is cruel monsieur i shall never be the same man again for he loved me and understood me and i loved him at last there was only one horse left in that camp and this was how he survived he had laid himself down to die his eyes were fogging over he felt so weak but one of the sick soldiers happened to pass that way and being full of pity from his own recent sufferings he bethought him of a disused mattress which he had seen in the hospital close by he returned and took out a handful of straws with which he fed the poor beast a straw at a time the flaccid lips mumbled them away at last he managed to moisten the straw and eat a little another handful was fetched and the horse pricked his ears and tried to lift his head that was the turning point life became almost worth living again the story rapidly spread and it became the charitable custom to spare a bit of bread from dinner for the white horse of the ile cambrière in time that spoilt child would neigh and trot to meet any trooper who approached confidently looking for his perquisite of crust there were twenty thousand horses in metz at the beginning of the siege at the time of the surrender a little over two thousand we are told by an englishman who was with the german army outside metz that in october a good many frenchmen deserted from metz on the eleventh a poor wretch was brought into the german lines he said that his desertion was a matter of arrangement with his comrades the man was an alsatian and spoke german well his regiment was supposed to be living under canvas but the stench in the tents was so strong by reason of skin diseases that nearly all slept in the open air the skin disease was caused by the want of vegetables and salt and by living wholly on horse flesh the deserter reported that the troops had refused to make any more sorties and they were all suffering from scurvy there was one village neuilly which contained secret stores to which the french used to resort and which the germans could not find so the order was given to burn it most of its inhabitants had gone to live in metz i was sitting at supper with lieutenant von hussius and fischer when an orderly entered with a note it was read aloud lieutenant von hussius will parade at nine o'clock with fifteen volunteers of his company and will proceed to burn the village of neuilly von hussius was fond of herrings so he stayed at table to finish them while fischer went out for volunteers in a few minutes von hussius was putting on his long boots taking his little dagger which every officer wore to ward off the vultures of the battlefield in case of being wounded then taking his revolver he sallied out to meet his little band the service was full of danger for the french lay very near and had strong temptations for entering it by night if he did encounter a french force inside the village where would his fifteen volunteers be a little group of us watched by the watchfire as they marched down at the german quickstep for a while we could hear the crashing through the vines then the hoarse challenge of the german rear sentry then all became quiet for a few minutes the officer in command of the outpost and myself were the only persons who enjoyed the genial warmth of the fire then through the gloom came stalking the major who squatted down silently by our side presently another form appeared the colonel himself and in half an hour nearly all the officers of the battalion were round that bright wood fire they all tried to look unconcerned but everybody was very fidgety von hussies was a long time an hour had gone and neuilly was but ten minutes or so distant and the colonel's nervousness was undisguised as he hacked at the burning log with his naked sword suddenly the vigilant lieutenant gave a smothered shout and we all sprang to our feet flame-coloured smoke at last and plenty of it but bah it was too far away a false alarm the colonel sat down moodily and the major muttered something like a swear 
one thing was good there was no sound of musketry firing another half hour of suspense and then a loud ha ah! from both lieutenant and sentry this time it was neuilly and no mistake not from one isolated house but in six places at once belched out the long streaks of flame against the black darkness and the separate fires made haste to connect themselves in ten minutes the whole place was in one grand blaze the church steeple standing up in the midst of the sea of flame until a firework of sparks burst from its top and it reeled to its fall presently they came back von Hussius panting with the exertion he was of a portly figure the duty had been done without firing a single shot and they brought with them a respectable old horse which they had found in a village stable one evening when the german officers were discussing the causes of the french defeats a first lieutenant told this story to illustrate it the chief rabbi of the danzig jews had taken a new house and his flock determined to stock his wine butt for him on a stated evening his friends went down one after another into the rabbi's cellar and emptied each his bottle into the big vat when the rabbi came next day to draw off his dinner wine he found the cask was full of pure water each jew had said to himself that one bottle of water would never be noticed in so great a quantity of wine and so the poor rabbi had not got a drop of wine in his butt now it was just the same with the french army one soldier said to himself that it would not matter a copper if he sneaked away but the bother was that one and all took the same line of reasoning and the result was that nobody was left to look the enemy in the face in order to bring about the fall of metz a little sooner the prussians drove out all the peasants from the neighboring villages and forced them down to metz the mayor of metz ordered them back then the prussians fired over their heads and tried to frighten them down again meanwhile the women and children were worn out and hungry and sat down to cry and wish for death these are some of the glories of war sometimes when they returned to their village home after a week's absence they found a remarkable change they had left a pretty villa trim gardens and a tiny pond and summer-house this is what an englishman saw one day i came on a little group the extreme pathos of which made my heart swell it was a family and they all sat in front of what had once been their home that home was now roofless the stones of the walls were all that was left the garden was a wreck and the whole scene was concentrated desolation the husband leaned against the wall his arms folded his head on his chest the wife sat on the wet ground weeping over the babe at her breast two elder children stared around them with wonder and unconcern too young to realize their misfortune no home no food a wagon and a field with four graves in it a sight enough to melt the hardest heart but there were so many similar scenes and some much more terrible to witness on the twenty ninth of october in torrents of rain the french soldiers went out of metz casting down their rifles and swords in heaps at the gate many glad enough to become prisoners of war and have a full stomach the germans came in very cautiously examining fort and bastion and bridge to prevent any mine explosions and in a few hours metz la pucelle had become a german city marshal bazaine who had done so little to help them was the object of every citizen's curses the women pelted him with mud and called him coward as he set off for the prussian headquarters from the siege of metz by mr g t robinson by kind permission of messrs bradbury and evans End of chapter nineteen Chapter twenty of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty Plevna, eighteen seventy seven. An English boy as Turkish lieutenant, a melee, wounded by a horseman, takes letter to Russian camp, the Tsar watches the guns, Skobelev's charge, the great Todleben arrives, Skobelev deals with cowards pasting labels the last sortie osman surrenders 
prisoners in the snow bucharest ladies very kind after turkey had put down the insurrection in bulgaria eighteen seventy six and had beaten servia october eighteen seventy six russia made her tenth attempt to seize constantinople the czar alexander the second declared war against the sultan abdul hamad second and the result was a war which in cruelty and horrors has had no equal since the first napoleon retired to st helena there were a few young englishmen fighting on the side of the turks one of whom lieutenant herbert has left us a full account of the siege of plevna he says in his preface i have witnessed much that was heroic much that was grand soul-stirring sublime but infinitely more of what was hideous and terrible if you have too firm a belief in the glories of soldiering try a war herbert was soon made musalim or lieutenant and his friend jack seymour was in the same company the first successes of the russians were checked when osman pasha stood at bay at plevna and the turks literally dug themselves into the hills around the city while the russians lost thousands of men in vain assaults upon the earthworks it was in the second battle of plevna that a bimbashi or major came up to herbert and said the general has sent for reinforcements take your company an orderly will show the way do your best muslim you are but a boy in a position which might unnerve a man twice your age rise to the occasion as englishmen are wont to do the soldiers love you you and your compatriot have but to lead and they will follow remember the czar nicholas furious cry in the crimean war we have been beaten by a handful of savages led by british boys as they climbed to a distant hill they suddenly overlooked a battlefield of twenty square miles in area terrible to see terrible to hear the thunder of two hundred and forty guns seemed like a crash of so many volcanoes the earth trembled like a living thing it was like standing in the center of a raging fire presently the russian troops drew near the turks began a quick fire of three minutes duration deep gaps showed in their lines but they were soon filled up and still they drew nearer the russian hurrah and the wild turkish cry of allah mingled together now there were only one hundred paces between the charging lines the russians coming uphill the turks rushing down then came a chaos of stabbing clubbing hacking shouting cursing men knots of two or three on the ground clinging to each other in a deadlier rugby football butt ends of rifles rising and falling like the cranks of many engines horses charging into solid bodies of men frantic faces streaming with blood all the madhouses of the world might be discharging their contents into this seething cauldron of human passion i remember nothing all i know is that i discharged the six chambers of my revolver but at whom i have no notion that my saber was stained with blood but with whose i cannot tell that suddenly we looked at one another in blank surprise for the russians had gone save those left on the ground and we were among friends all frantic breathless perspiring many bleeding the lines broken all of us jabbering laughing dancing about like maniacs fifteen minutes after the first charge the russians returned of this charge i remember one item too well a giant on a big horse a colonel i think galloped up to me and dealt me a terrific blow from above i parried as well as i could but his sword cut across my upturned face across nose and chin where the mark is visible to this day i felt the hot blood trickle down my throat he passed on sergeant bacall my friend and counsellor spoke to me pointing to my face jack said something in a compassionate voice i fainted when i came to myself my head had been bandaged the nose plastered all over water was given me how grateful i was for that delicious drink then i was supported by friends to the outskirts of plevna as we went along i noticed a russian lieutenant who after creeping along for a space had sat down by the side of the track leaning against the belly of a dead horse he was calmly awaiting death in awful forsakenness 
He counted barely twenty summers, poor boy. He looked at me, oh, so wistfully and sadly, with the sweet divine light of deliverance shining in his tearful eyes. He said faintly, De l'eau, monsieur. I had some cold coffee left in my flask, which I got my companion to pour down his throat. He bowed his poor bruised head gratefully, and we left him to die. The ground was strewn with haversacks, rifles, swords, wounded men. Riderless horses, neighing vehemently, trotted about in search of food. These sights were revealed to me by the peaceful dying golden light of a summer sunset. Even war, that hell-born product of the iniquity of monarchs and statesmen, receives its quota of sunshine. A few weeks later, Herbert was summoned to the Farique, or General of Division, and asked if he could speak French well enough to take a letter into the Russian camp. He said yes, made himself smart in new tunic and boots, and flattered himself that his tanned, smooth, youthful face looked well below the bright red fez with its jaunty tassel, in spite of his chin being still under repair. A corporal, carrying a white flag and a bugler well mounted, rode with him. They were handsome strapping fellows in the highest of spirits. After a ride of six miles they came in sight of a detachment of Cossacks. A young Russian lieutenant rode to meet them, waving his handkerchief. Herbert stated his business in French, was asked to dismount while awaiting instructions. The Russians crowded round out of curiosity. The horses were fed and watered, cigarettes were exchanged, and friendly talk ensued. In half an hour a horseman rode up, and Herbert was bidden to mount. His eyes were bandaged, his horse was bled. After a sharp trot of twenty minutes they halted, the handkerchief was taken off, and he found himself in a battery. An officer came up and took the letter, then handed Herbert over to an infantry colonel, who took him into a small tent. Here, with some other officers, they had a cosy meal, wine, bread, and soup, a pleasant chat and smiles all around. It was a fortnight since the last battle, and the Russians were still lost in admiration of the bravery with which the Turks had defended their positions. Vos hommes, mon camarade, sont des diables. Jamais je n'ai vu pareille chose that was just a glimpse of the enemy and proved that though men may fight by order they may yet be friends at heart the czar alexander had been present watching the varied issues of every fight and assault the sappers had built for him a kind of outlook on a little hill beyond the line of fire where he could see far away on all sides a large tent was standing behind supplied with food and wine where his suite made merry but the poor, worn, anxious Tsar could not eat, could not bide in his safe tower, but would go wandering round among the gunners and the guns. It was his fete day when the great September battle was being fought. There he stood alone on his little balcony under the lowering sky of an autumn day, gazing through his glass at the efforts of his soldiers to storm the Gravitsa redoubt. All the afternoon, assault had followed assault in vain and now the last desperate effort the forlorn hope was being pushed to the front the pale drawn face on the balcony was now quivering with agonized sorrow the tall figure was bent and bowed and seemed to wince under the lash of some destroying angel with awful losses the russian battalions staggered and struggled up the slopes slippery with their comrades blood see sire they have entered the redoubt it is carried at last hardly has the czar time to smile and breathe a prayer of gratitude when from a second redoubt higher up a terrible fire is turned on the russians and they are swept out of the place they had so hardly won there was one russian officer who seemed to have a charmed life he was the bravest of the brave was beloved by his men and did marvels of heroic feats Skobelev, 
On a day of battle, Skobeleff always wore a white frock coat with all his decorations. Seeing the battalions coming back from the Gravitsa in disorderly route, the tall white figure on the white horse dashed at full speed down the slope, past the linesmen, who gave their loved chief a great cheer as he galloped by, caught up the riflemen who were advancing in support, and swept them on at the double men sprang to their feet and rapturously cheered the white-clad leader he reached the wavering beaten mass pointed upwards with his sword and imparted to daunted hearts some of his own courage and enthusiasm they turned with him and tried yet once more then the white horse went down the glass trembled in the hands of alexander he is down no sire he rises he mounts again see they are over and into the turkish entrenchments what a medley of sights and sounds flame and smoke and shouts and screams but the russians were for the present masters of the redoubt in the evening skobeleff rode back without a scratch on him though his white coat was covered with blood and froth and mud his horse his last white charger was shot dead on the edge of the ditch his blade was broken off short by the hilt every man of his staff was killed or wounded except kuropetkin general skobeleff wrote magan to the daily news was in a fearful state of excitement and fury his cross of st george twisted over his shoulder his face black with powder and smoke his eyes haggard and bloodshot his voice quite gone i never saw such a picture of battle as he presented but a few hours later the general was calm and collected he said in a low quiet voice i have done my best i could do no more my detachment is half destroyed my regiments no longer exist i have no officers left they sent me no reinforcements i have lost three guns why did they send you no help who was to blame i blame nobody said skobeleff then solemnly crossing himself he added it was the will of god the will of god skobeleff's heroism was magnificent and did much to nerve the common soldier to face the turkish batteries but success came not that way men and officers began to ask one another why the czar did not send them the help of the great todleben who had defended sebastopol so brilliantly it seems that the grand duke nicholas had nourished a grudge against russia's most eminent engineer and had kept him out of all honourable employment but alexander had sent for todleben and this was the turn of the tide todleben came in such haste from russia that he had brought no horses with him now he was at last in the russian camp a handsome tall dignified man of sixty straight and active and very affable to all the attack was to be changed no more deadly assaults in front but a complete investment and wait till famine steps in to make osman submit but skobeleff had not yet finished with daring assaults one day the green hill which the russians had taken under his command was being endangered by turkish sharpshooters russian recruits who were posted near had fallen back in a scare thrown down their rifles and simply run like hares skobeleff met them in full flight and in grim humour shouted good health my fine fellows my fine brave fellows the men halted and gave the customary salute being very shamefaced withal you are all noble fellows perfect heroes you are i am proud to command you silent and confounded they shambled from one leg to another by the way said skobeleff still blandly smiling i do not see your rifles the men cast their eyes down and said not a word where are your rifles i ask you in a sterner tone there was a painful silence which skobeleff broke with a voice of thunder his face changed to an awful frown his glance made the men cower so you have thrown away your weapons you are cowards you run away from turks you are a disgrace to your country my god right about face my children follow me the general marched them up to the spot where they had left their rifles and ordered them to take them up and follow him 
then he led them out into the space in front of the trench right in the line of the turkish fire and there he put them through their exercises standing with his back to the turks while the bullets could be heard whistling over and around them only two of them were hit during this strange drill then he let them go back to their trenches saying the next time any one of you runs away he will be shot the investment of plevna went on relentlessly through october november and part of december by the ninth most of all their food was exhausted and osman determined to try one last sortie before surrendering herbert had charge of a train of a battalion outside the town he made up a fire saw his men installed for the night and then walked to the town a snowfall was coming down lazily bivouac fires lit up the gaunt figures of men and beasts the men talking of tomorrow's fight in a subdued tone were yet excited and eager many turkish residents with their carts and vehicles were spending the night on the snow-covered plain the men brooding and gloomy the veiled women sobbing the children playing hide-and-seek around the fires and among the carts it was a weird sight all these thousands eager to go out after the army when the last struggle should have carved them an open road through the surrounding foe at headquarters an officer met herbert and asked him to post some labels at the ambulance doors of a certain street he says armed with a brush and paste pot i turned bill sticker and affixed a notice on some twenty house doors which were showing the ambulance flag anything more dismal than that deserted town abandoned by all but dying and helpless men and some four hundred starving bulgarian families cannot be imagined desolate dead god-forsaken plevna during the night of the ninth and tenth of december was no more like the thriving and pretty plevna of july than the decaying corpse of an old hag is like the living body of a blooming girl the streets unlighted and empty save for a slouching outcast here and there bent on rapine echoed to the metallic ring of my solitary steps while occasional groans or curses proceeding from the interior of the ambulances haunted me long afterwards as sounding unearthly in the dark twice i stumbled over corpses which had been thrust into the gutter as the quickest way of getting rid of them as i walked i had to shake myself and pinch my flesh so much like the fantasy of an ugly dream was the scene to my mind as i plied my brush on the door panels i felt like one alive in a gigantic graveyard at one of the ambulances i was bidden to enter and found by the feeble light of a reeking oil lamp some invalids fighting for a remnant of half-rotten food which they had just discovered in a forgotten cupboard men without legs hands or feet were clutching scratching kicking struggling for morsels that no respectable dog or cat would look at twice i pacified them and distributed the unsavory bits of meat as i turned to go a man without legs caught hold of me from his mattress begging me to carry him to the train bivouac that he might follow the army happily an attendant turned up and i wrenched myself away herbert was returning by a narrow dark lane when someone sprang upon him and tore the paste pot away from him he had doubtless seen it by the light of the lieutenant's lantern and thought the vessel contained food he belabored the fellow's face with his brush making it ghastly white and setting him off to splutter and croak and swear and finally he rammed the brushes hard down his throat at this moment two other bulgarians came up but taking time by the forelock herbert pasted their mouths and eyes before they could speak then shouted out good night gentlemen and i wish you a very hearty appetite he then turned and ran for all he was worth to the officers mess room it was about ten o'clock p m when osman pasha and his staff rode up preceded by a mounted torch-bearer and escorted by a body of saloniki cavalry when he came out again the light from the torch fell full upon his face his features were drawn and careworn the cheeks hollow there were deep lines on the forehead and blue rings under his eyes their expression was one of angry determination 
he responded to the salute with that peculiar nod which was more a frown than a greeting they all rose and went after him into the street to see him mount his fine arab horse he and his staff spent that last night in one of the farmhouses on the western outskirts of plevna after a supper of gruel and bread herbert and the others walked in a body to the train bivouac the night was intensely dark a few snowflakes were flying about it was freezing a little they did not talk for each was saying to himself it is all over with us now hardly any expected to see the next nightfall herbert and two other lieutenants slept in a hut by the river's brink they could hear the water murmuring and every now and then a lump of ice made music against the piles a little after five in the morning he moved on crossed with the first division the shaky pontoon bridge and rejoined his company twenty-four crack battalions of the first division were marching on to face the ring of russian guns the dark hoods of the great coats drawn over the fez and pointing upwards gave an element of grotesqueness to the men they were marching to certain death with hope in their hearts in front the russian entrenchments rose out of the vapors and fog in threatening silence once beyond them and they were free the country and military honor called for this supreme sacrifice and they offered it full willingly at nine thirty a m the bugle sounded advance and the whole line two miles long began to move in one grand column the turks went at the quick hurling a hail of lead before them the troops kept repeating the arabic phrase bismillah ramin in the name of the merciful god but the fire became so deadly that they came to a dead stop the men in the front line lay down on their stomachs after an interval of ten minutes the bugles of the first division sounded storm the men jumped to their feet and rushed at the nearest trench a murderous discharge of rifle fire greeted them many bit the dust but very soon the turks had the first trench in their possession then a second and third and before they knew what they were about they were in the midst of the russian guns hacking clubbing stabbing shooting whilst overhead flew countless shells hissing and leaving a white trail in their track then they waited for the support of the second line which never came but at noon the russians came down upon them in force herbert was ordered to ride and report that they could not hold out longer without reinforcements he says as i rode towards the centre i was drawn into the vortex of a most awful panic a wild flight for safety to the right bank of the river i had never been in a general retreat it is far more terrible than the most desperate encounter i was simply drawn along in a mad stream of men horses and carts officers their faces streaming with perspiration in spite of the cold were trying to restore order the train got mixed with the infantry and the batteries and the confusion baffles description my horse slipped into a ditch and i continued on foot i heard that osman had been wounded and carted across the river the pitiless shells followed us even to the other side of the river the screams of the women in the carts unnerved many a sturdy man i came to a sort of barn where two saloniki horsemen stood sentry being dead beat and hungry to starving point i sat down on a stone whilst i crunched a biscuit a cart drove up and a man badly wounded in the leg was assisted into the building so sallow and pain-drawn was his face that at first i failed to recognize osman there were tears in his eyes tears of grief and rage rather than of physical pain and in their expression lay that awful thought the game is up the end is come which we see in misenia's picture of napoleon in the retreat from waterloo the last sortie from plevna was witnessed by skobeleff from the heights above the turkish infantry were deploying with great smartness taking advantage of the cover afforded by the ground the skirmishers were already out in the open driving before them the russian outposts skobeleff was very excited were there ever more skilful tactics he said 
They are born soldiers, these Turks, already halfway to Ganesi's front, hidden first by the darkness and now by the long bank under which they are forming in perfect safety. Beautiful indeed! Never was a sortie more skillfully prepared. How I should like to be in command of it! Skobelev then turned his glass on the Russian defense line. He seldom swore, but now a torrent of oaths burst from his lips. Oh, that ass, that consummate ass Ganetsky, he shouted, striking his thigh with his clenched fist. What fool's work! He had his orders. He was warned of the intended sortie. He might have had any number of reinforcements. And what preparation has he made? None. He is confronting Osmond's army with six battalions when he might have had twenty-four. Mark my words, the Turk will carry our first line with a rush. We shall retrieve it, but to have lost it for ever so short a time will be our disgrace for ever. Then Skobelev spat angrily and rode off at a gallop. How true those words were, we have seen already. At 2 p.m. Osman had been obliged to surrender, and shortly after he met the Russian Grand Duke Nicholas, Osman in a carriage, Nicholas on horseback. They looked one another long in the face, then Nicholas offered his hand heartily and said, "'General, I honor you for your noble defense of Plevna. It has been among the most splendid examples of skill and heroism in modern history.' Osman's face winced a little, perhaps a twitch of pain crossed it, as, in spite of his wound, he struggled to his feet and uttered a few broken words in a low tone. The Russian officers saluted with great demonstration of respect, and shouts of bravo rang out again and again. Poor victorious Osman, conquered at last by King Famine. He had lived in a common green tent during the whole period of the investment. His last night at Plevna was the first he spent under a roof. Lieutenant Herbert says concerning the surrender, As the Romanian soldiers seized our weapons, I became possessed of an uncontrollable fury. I broke my sword, thrust carbine, revolvers, and ammunition into the wagon a private with semitic features perceived my circassian dagger but i managed to spoil it by breaking the point before handing it over another man annexed my field glass i never saw my valise again which had been stored on one of the battalion's carts i had saved a portion of my notes and manuscripts by carrying them like a breast curious between uniform and vest having given vent to rage i fell into the opposite mood and sitting down on a stone i hid my face in my hands and abandoned myself to the bitterest half-hour of reflection i have ever endured luckily herbert fell in with a roumanian lieutenant whom he knew who took him to the russian camp and gave him hot grog bread and cold meat how we devoured the food he says we actually licked the mugs out as they walked away in the dark to their night quarters they happened to pass the spot where herbert's battalion was encamped without fires or tents in an open snow-covered field exposed to the north wind cries of distress and rage greeted them and they found that the drunken russian soldiers were robbing their turkish prisoners not only of watches money etc but also of their biscuits their only food herbert stopped for a minute and gave away all he had left but some russians jumped upon him and rifled his pockets before he could recall his companions to his aid everybody in camp seemed to be drunk herbert went to sleep in a mud hut and slept for twelve hours without awaking being very kindly treated by a russian major but the turks suffered terribly they spent the night of the tenth on the same cold spot their arms had been taken from them also their money biscuits and even their greatcoats it froze and snowed and they were allowed no fires it was a fortnight before all the prisoners had left the neighborhood during this time from three thousand to four thousand men had succumbed to their privations the defense of plevna had lasted a hundred and forty-three days as the grand duke nicholas told osman it was one of the finest things done in military history but it cost the russians fifty-five thousand men the roumanians ten thousand and the turks thirty thousand 
there is a turkish proverb though your enemy be as small as an ant yet act as if he were as big as an elephant had the russians been guided by this they might have saved many losses one bitterly cold morning with two feet of snow on the ground i joined a detachment of prisoners escorted by romanians we travelled via sistoon to bucharest crossing the danube by the russian pontoon bridge this journey which lasted eight days was the most dreadful part of my experience lying as it did through snow-clad country with storms and bitter winds i and fifty others had seats on carts the bulk of the prisoners had to tramp i saw at least four hundred men drop to be taken as little notice of as if they were so much awful to die of starvation or be devoured by the wolves which prowled around our column over each man who fell a hideous crowd of crows ravens vultures hovered until he was exhausted enough to be attacked with impunity some of the soldiers of the escort were extremely brutal others displayed a touching kindness most were as stolid and apathetic as their captives of osman's army of forty eight thousand men only fifteen thousand reached russian soil only twelve thousand returned to their homes in bucharest our sufferings were at an end in the streets ladies distributed coffee broth bread tobacco cigarettes spirit our quarters in the barracks appeared to us like paradise then by train to kharkov where herbert got a check from his father and was allowed much freedom on parole he made many friends and was lionized and feasted and fattened like a show beast i was treated he says with all the chivalrous kindness and open-handed hospitality which are the characteristics of the educated russians the effects of the brutal propensities developed in warfare wore off speedily and i am now a mild and inoffensive being whose conscience does not allow the killing of a flea or the plucking of a flower from the defense of plevna by w v herbert eighteen ninety five by kind permission of measures longmans green and company end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one siege of khartoum eighteen eighty four gordon invited to the soudan the mahdi chinese gordon his religious feeling not supported by england arabs attack blacks as cowards pashas shot the abbas sent down with stuart her fate relief coming provisions fail a sick steamer bordine sent down to shendy alone on the housetop sir charles wilson and beersford steam up the rapids and sandbank do you see the flag turn and fly gordon's fate in january eighteen eighty four charles gordon was asked by the british government to go to egypt and withdraw from the soudan the garrisons the civil officials and any of the inhabitants that might wish to be taken away it was a dangerous duty he had to perform as the mahdi a religious pretender in whom many believed had just annihilated an egyptian army led by an englishman hicks pasha and supported by the arab slave dealers had revolted against egyptian rule gordon had some years before been governor-general of the soudan for the khedive ishmael he had been then offered ten thousand pounds a year but would not take more than two thousand pounds for he knew it would be blood money wrung from the wretches under his rule when previously chinese gordon as he was called had put down the taiping rebels for the chinese government he refused the enormous treasure which was offered him in order to mark his resentment at the treachery of the emperor for having executed the rebel chiefs after gordon had promised them their lives gordon was a man of simple piety god dwells in us was the doctrine he most valued after the bible the imitation of christ the writings of epictetus and marcus aurelius seem to have been his favorites he once wrote 
amongst troubles and worries no one can have peace till he stays his soul upon his god it gives a man superhuman strength the quiet peaceful life of our lord was solely due to his submission to god's will such was the man whom england sent out too late to face the rising storm of arab rebellion gordon reached khartoum on the eighteenth of february taking up his quarters in the palace which had been his home in years before he had come he said without troops nor would he fight with any weapons but justice the chains were struck off from the limbs of the prisoners in the dungeons i shall make them love me he said and the black people came in their thousands to kiss his feet calling him the sultan of the soudan but time went by and gordon could not get the government at home to second his schemes so that the natives began to lose confidence in him and sided with the mahdi the arabs began to attack khartoum on the twelfth of march and from that date until his death gordon was engaged in defending the city khartoum is situated on the western bank of the blue nile on a spit of sand between the junction of that river with the white nile nearly all the records of this period have been lost but it is proved that wire entanglements were stretched in front of the earthen works mines were laid down the yarrow built steamers were made bullet-proof and furnished with towers guns were mounted on the public buildings and expeditions in search of food were sent out it was gordon's habit to go up on the roof at sunrise and scan the country around i am not alone he would say for he is ever with me on the sixteenth of march he had to look upon his native troops retiring before the rebel horsemen he writes our gun with the regulars opened fire very soon a body of about sixty rebel horsemen charged down upon my bashi bazooks who fired a volley then turned and fled the horsemen galloped towards my square of regulars which they immediately broke the whole force then retreated slowly towards the fort with their rifles shouldered the men made no effort to stand and the gun was abandoned pursuit ceased about a mile from stockade and there the men rallied we brought in the wounded nothing could be more dismal than seeing these horsemen and some men even on camels pursuing close to troops who with arms shouldered plotted their way home but gordon was no weak humanitarian two pashas were tried and found guilty of cowardice and were promptly shot pour encourager les autres after that he tried to train his men to face the enemy by little skirmishes and he made frequent sallies with his river steamers you see he wrote when you have steam on the men can't run away then began a long and weary waiting for the relief which came not until it was too late the arabs kept on making attacks which they never pressed home expecting to effect a surrender from scarcity of food in september only three months food remained no news came from england they knew not if england even thought of them the population of khartoum was at first about sixty thousand souls nearly twenty thousand of these were sent away as the siege went on as being friends of the mahdi on the ninth of september gordon sent down the nile in a small paddle-boat named the abbas colonel stewart mr power monsieur herbin the french consul some greeks and about fifty soldiers they took with them letters journals dispatches which were to be sent from dongola the abbas drew little water the river was in full flood and they seemed likely to be able to get over the rapids with safety henceforth gordon was alone with his black and egyptian troops one might have thought that his heart would have sunk within him at the loneliness of his situation at the feeling of desertion by england and of treachery in his own garrison he had no friend to speak to no sympathetic companion left in khartoum yes he had one friend left and in his journal he tells us that he was happier and more peaceful now than in the earlier months of the siege he is always with me may our lord not visit us as a nation for our sins but may his wrath fall on me hid in christ this is my frequent prayer and may he spare these people and bring them to peace <laughs> 
the ill-fated abbas was wrecked her passengers and crew were murdered her papers were taken to the mahdi who now knew exactly how long khartoum could hold out against famine on the twenty first of september gordon first heard the news of a relief expedition being sent from england and three days later he resolved to dispatch armed steamers to matema down the nile to await the arrival of our troops they started on the thirtieth taking with them many of gordon's best men but gordon went on drilling feeding the hungry visiting the sick writing hopefully and sometimes merrily in his journals for instance writing of an official who had telegraphed i should like to be informed exactly when gordon expects to be in difficulties as to provisions and ammunition gordon remarks this man must be preparing a great statistical work if he will only turn to his archives he will see we have been in difficulties for provisions for some months it is as if a man on the bank having seen his friend in a river already bobbed down two or three times hails i say old fellow let us know when we are to throw you the life buoy i know you have bobbed down two or three times but it is a pity to throw you the life buoy until you are in extremis and i want to know exactly on the twenty first of october the mahdi arrived before khartoum and gordon was informed of the loss of the abbas and the death of his friends to this gordon replied tell the mahdi that it is all one to me whether he has captured twenty thousand steamers like the abbas i am here like iron on the second of november there were left provisions for six weeks and he could not put the troops on half rations lest they should desert on the twelfth an attack was made upon omdurman a little way down the river and on gordon's steamers ismalia and Husanye the latter was struck by shells and had to be run aground in the journal we read from the roof of the palace i saw that poor little beast husanyaya fall back stern foremost under a terrific fire of breech loaders i saw a shell strike the water at her bows i saw her stop and puff off steam and then i gave the glass to my boy sickened unto death my boy <laughs> he is thirty said husanaya is sick i knew it but said quietly go down and telegraph to mogram is husanaya sick on the twenty second of november gordon summed up his losses he had lost nearly nineteen hundred men and two hundred and forty two had been wounded and where were the english boats that were to hurry up the nile to his rescue on the thirtieth of november only one boat had passed the third cataract the remaining six hundred were creaking and groaning under the huge strain that was hauling them painfully through the womb of rocks in december the desertions from the garrison increased as the food supply decreased there was not fifteen days food left now in khartoum so the steamer bordine was sent down to shendi with letters and his journal in a letter to his sister he writes i am quite happy thank god and like lawrence i have tried to do my duty the last entry in his journal runs as follows i have done the best for the honor of our country good-bye you send me no information though you have lots of money evidently this high-souled man was cut to the heart by what he thought was the ingratitude and neglect of england he could not know that thousands of englishmen and canadians were toiling up the nile flood to save him if it were possible but alas they all started too late since valuable time had been wasted in long arguments held in london as to which might be the best route to khartoum meanwhile starvation was beginning strange things were eaten by those who still remained faithful to the last only fourteen hundred now were left in the city but omdurman had been taken the arabs were pressing closer and fiercer and egyptian officers came to gordon clamoring for surrender then he would go up upon the roof his face set his teeth clenched he would strain his eyes in looking to the north for some sign some tiny sign of help coming he cared not for his own life the almighty god will help me he wrote but he did care for the honor of england and that honor seemed to him to be sullied 
by our leaving him here at bay and all alone meanwhile the english had fought their way to gubat where they found the steamers which gordon had sent to meet them so tired were the men that after a drink of river water they fell down like logs four of gordon's steamers with sir charles wilson and captain c beersford started from gubat on the twenty fourth of january with twenty english soldiers and some undisciplined blacks they were like the london penny steamers that one shell would have sent to the bottom they were heavily laden with indian corn fuel and dura for the khartoum garrison each steamer flew two egyptian flags one at the foremast and one at the stern every day they had to stop for wood to supply the engines when the men would be off after loot or fresh meat when they reached the cataract and rapids the bordines struck on a rock and could not be moved for many hours the nile water running like a mill race under her keel arabs on the bank were taking pot shots at her and the blacks on board grinned good-humouredly and replied with a wasteful fusillade after shifting the guns and stores the crew got the bordine to move on the twenty sixth of january but only to get fast upon a sand-bank precious time was thus lost and on the twenty seventh of january a camel man shouted from the bank that khartoum was taken and gordon killed no one believed this news near halfia a heavy fire was opened upon them at six hundred yards from four guns and many rifles the gunners on the steamers were naked and looked like demons in the smoke one huge giant was the very incarnation of savagery drunk with war writes sir charles wilson when the steamers had passed the batteries the soudanese crews screamed with delight lifting up their rifles and shaking them above their heads soon they saw the government house at khartoum above the trees and excitement stirred every heart the soudanese commander kashem el mus kept on saying do you see the flag no one could see the flag then something has happened he muttered however there was no help for it they had to go on past tuti island and omdurman spattered and flogged with thousands of bullets it is all over all over groaned kashim as to the sound of the nordenfelt was added the deeper note of the krupp guns from khartoum itself as they reached the elephant's trunk so the sand spit was called below khartoum they saw hundreds of dervishes ranged under their banners in order to resist the landing so the order was given with a heavy heart turn her and run full speed down then the soudanese on board who till now had been fighting enthusiastically collapsed and sank wearily on the deck the poor fellows had lost their all wives families houses what is the use of firing i have lost all said kashim burying his face in his mantle but they got him upon his legs and the moment of sorrowful despair changed again to desperate revenge after all the steamers got safely back and general gordon we left him alone in command of a hungry garrison what of him from examinations of gordon's officers taken later it seems that before daylight on the twenty sixth of january the arabs attacked one of the gates and met with little or no resistance there was reason to fear treachery for some three hours the arabs went through the city killing every one they met some of them went to the palace and there met gordon walking in front of a small party of men he was probably going to the church where the ammunition was stored to make his last stand the rebels fired a volley and gordon fell dead it is reported that his head was cut off and exposed above the gate at omdurman we may be glad that it was a sudden death called away by the god in whom he trusted so simply thus died one of england's greatest heroes one of the world's most holy men the siege had lasted three hundred and seventeen days nine days less than the siege of sebastopol and the mahdi ascribed the result to his god in a letter sent to the british officers on the steamers he says god has destroyed khartoum and other places by our hands nothing can withstand his power and might and by the bounty of god all has come into our hands there is no god but god <laughs>
Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Kumasi, nineteen hundred. The Governor's Visit, Pageant of Kings, Evil Omens, The Fetish Grove, The Fort, Loyal Natives Locked Out, A Fight, King Aguna's Triumph, Relief at Last, Their Perils, Saved by a Dog, Second Relief, Governor Retires, Wait for Colonel Wilcox, The Flag Still Flying, Lady Hodson's Adventures. In 1874, Sir Garnet Wolsey captured Kumasi, the capital of the Ashantes, whose country lies in the interior of the Gold Coast in West Africa. In March 1900, Sir Frederick Hodson, governor of the Gold Coast, set out with Lady Hodson and a large party of carriers and attendants to visit Ashanti land. They had no anticipation of any trouble arising, and on their march held several palavers with friendly kings and chiefs. On Sunday, the 25th of March, they entered Kumasi in state. At the brow of a steep hill the European officials met the governor's party and escorted them into the town. At the base of the hill they had to cross a swamp on a high causeway and then ascend a short hill to the fort. Some children under the Basel missionaries sang God Save the Queen at a spot where only a few years before human sacrifices and every species of horrible torture used to be enacted soon they passed under a triumphal arch decorated with palms having welcome worked upon it in flowers near the fort were assembled in a gorgeous pageant native kings and chiefs with their followers who all rose up to salute the governor while the royal umbrellas of state were rapidly twirled round and round to signify the general applause everything seemed to promise order and contentment but that night lady hodson was informed by her native servants that very bad fetishes or portents had been passed on the road through the forest one of these was a fowl split open while still alive and laid upon a fetish stone another was a string of eggs twined about a fetish house a third was the presence of little mounds of earth to represent graves a token that the white man would find burial in ashante the next day lady hodson went to see the once famous fetish grove the place into which the bodies of those slain for human sacrifices were thrown most of its trees had been blown up with dynamite in eighteen ninety six when our troops had marched in to restore order and the bones and skulls had been buried the executioners a hereditary office used to have a busy time in the old days for every offence was punished by mutilation or death for as the king of the quia country once told the boys at harrow school we have no prisons and we have to chop off ear or nose or hand and let the rascal go but the ashante victim had the right of appealing to the king against his sentence this right had become a dead letter because as soon as the sentence of execution had been pronounced the victim was surrounded by a clamorous crowd and a sharp knife was run through one cheek through the tongue and so out through the other cheek which somewhat impeded his power of appeal one would have thought that english rule and white justice would have been a pleasant change after the severity of the native law the fort is a good square building with rounded bastions at the four corners on each of these bastions is a platform on which can be worked a maxim gun each gun being protected by a roof above and by iron shutters at the sides the only entrance to the fort lies on the south where are heavy iron bullet-proof gates which can be secured by heavy beams resting in slots in the walls the walls of the fort are loopholed and inside are platforms for those who are defending to shoot from there is a well of good water in one corner of the square the ground all around the fort was cleared and it would be very difficult for an enemy to cross the open in any assault as soon as the governor of the gold coast knew that the ashante kings were bent on war he telegraphed for help from the coast and from the north where most of the hausa troops were employed 
They were 150 miles away from help, with a climate hot and unhealthy, the rainy season being near at hand, and they were surrounded by warlike and savage tribes. Fortunately, some of the native kings, with their followers, were loyal to the English queen. These tried to persuade the rebels to desist from revolt and lay their grievances before the governor in palaver but the more they tried to pacify them the more insolent were their demands the first detachment of hausa troops arrived on the eighteenth of april to the great joy of the little garrison but soon after their arrival the market began to fail the natives dare not come with foodstuffs and the roads were now closed on the twenty fifth a maxim gun was run out of the fort to check the advance of the ashantes but they possessed themselves of the town and loopholed the huts near the fort the loyal inhabitants of kumasi had left their homes and were crowded outside the walls of the fort bringing with them their portable goods being upwards of three thousand men women and children the gates of the fort had hitherto remained open but it was evident that the small english forces would be compelled to concentrate in the fort and as the refugees seemed to be bent on rushing the gates for safer shelter the order was given to close the gates gradually the gate guard was removed one by one and then came the work of shutting the gates and barricading them never shall i forget the sight my heart stood still for i knew that were this panic-stricken crowd to get in the fort would fall an easy prey to the rebels and we should be lost it was an anxious moment could the guards close the gates in face of that rushing multitude a moment later and the suspense was over there was a desperate struggle a cry a bang and the refugees fell back then they tried to climb up by the posts of the veranda so sentries had to be posted on the veranda to force them down again i felt very much for these poor folk writes lady hodson but besides the fact that the fort would not have accommodated a third of them the whole space was wanted for our troops the hours of that day went on with sniping from all sides sometimes the rebels would come out into the open to challenge a fight but the machine guns made them aware that boldness was not the best policy at night when our men flung themselves down to rest the whole sky was lit up with the fire of the hausa cantonments and of the town tongues of fire were leaping up to the skies on all sides lighting up the horrors of the scene around affrighting the women and children and adding to the anxiety of all night at kumasi was not a time of quiet repose the incessant chatter of men and women just outside the walls the yelling and squealing of children all made sleep difficult and there was ever the thought underlying all that to-morrow might be the end that the fort might be rushed by numbers but as it turned out the twenty-sixth dawned quietly so later in the day a strong escort of houses was sent to the hospital to recover if possible the drugs and medical stores which had been abandoned through the lack of carriers when the sick were brought into the fort fortunately the rebels had left the drugs and stores untouched and they were brought in with thankful alacrity the next night there was a hurricane of wind rushing through the forest trees and drenching the poor refugees who tried to light fires to keep themselves warm there was a dear old house sentry on the veranda near my bedroom who regarded me as his special charge on this occasion and on others when my curiosity prompted me to go on the veranda to see what was happening this old man would push me back saying in very broken english go to room a shanty man come very bad you no come out miss it had been hoped that by the twenty ninth of april the lagos hausa would have arrived to rescue them but they did not come and the rebels fired the hospital not liking our shells bursting amongst them the ashantes instead of retiring swarmed out into the open and advanced upon the fort the refugees were cowering down close to the walls and around them were the hausa outposts ready with their rifles in the fort were the gunners standing to their guns as the rebels came on jumping and shouting and dancing and firing the maxims opened upon them still they came on and now the housey outposts took up the fire 
at last the fight became a hand-to-hand -hand struggle and the guns in the fort had to cease firing lest they should hit friend and foe alike then some two hundred loyal natives led by captain armitage sallied out to the fight at their head were their chiefs prominent amongst whom was the young king of aguna dressed in his fetish war coat in the form of a jumper and hung back and front with fetish charms made from snake and other skins he also wore a pair of thick leather boots and where these ended his black legs began and continued until they met well above the knee a short trouser of colored cotton he also wore a fierce-looking headdress and carried war charms made of elephant tails proudly and well did he bear himself and at last to our joy a great cheer rose in the distance and proclaimed that the enemy were retiring soon king aguna came back triumphantly carried on the shoulders of two of his warriors to the gate of the fort where he met with a great ovation from his ladies who flocked round him pressing forward to shake his hand and congratulate him upon the victory so the day was won and with the loss of only one man killed and three wounded as the rebels fired over our heads captain middlemist had been too ill to take the command and it devolved upon captain g marshall royal west kent regiment who after his severe exertions suddenly succumbed and was brought into quarters half delirious the heat of the sun the excitement and the work had been too much for him fortunately he was well again the next day by this victory the rebels had been driven out of kumasi and across the swamps they had left behind large supplies of food and war stores which the garrison secured even the refugees outside the walls began to smile and sing it is astonishing how these children of nature suddenly change from the depth of woe to an ecstasy and delirium of delight but where were the lagos houses all this time four o'clock came five o'clock came and still no sign of their arriving anxious faces scanned the cape coast road something must have happened to them they had been met checked repulsed but at half past five firing was heard in the forest there they are said each to his neighbor and a feverish excitement made numbers run to the veranda posts and climb up to get a better view a force also was sent down the road to meet them how slow the time went with the watchers in the fort just before six o'clock there was a yell from the loyal natives and shouts announced that the houses were coming round the bend of the road the relief came in through the two long lines of natives who wanted to see the brave fellows who had fought their way up to the kumasi from the coast but poor fellows they had had a terrible time their officers were all wounded they had had nothing to eat or drink since early morning and they were fearfully exhausted however after they had slept a few hours and drunk some tea they were able to tell their tale captain applin who led them said we got on all right till we came to a village called isiago when we were attacked on both sides by a large force concealed among the trees i formed the men up too deep kneeling and facing the bush on either side by jove it was a perfect hail of slugs and we could not see a soul as the black chaps slid down the trunks of the trees into the jungle captain cochrane who was with the maxim was hit in the shoulder but would not leave his post and dr macfarlane was wounded while tending him then the machine guns became overheated and jammed and had to cease firing four times the enemy returned to the attack i got this graze on my cheek from a bullet which passed through my orderly's leg next day after crossing the orda river we were attacked at eleven a m and the fight lasted till five in the evening a sudden turn in the track and we saw a strongly built stockade horseshoe shape some ashantes were looking over the top and peering between the logs the track was so narrow that we had no front for firing and the whole path was swept by their guns i told off captain cochrane to outflank the stockade he with thirty houses crept away into the bush to do so meanwhile we ran short of ammunition and had to load with gravel and stones 
when i told the men to fix bayonets ready for a charge i found they were so done up they could hardly stand our hour seemed to have struck and the guns had again jammed just then three volleys sounded near the stockade cochrane was enfilading them hurrah instantly the ashanti fire began to slacken one charge and it was ours amongst those who had come in with the houses was mr branch an officer in the telegraph department in reply to lady hodson as to how he was so lame he replied i and my men were busy putting the line right to kumasi we were peacefully going through the forest when bang one of my hammock men went down shot and the rest carriers and all threw down their loads and bolted into the tangle of trees and undergrowth by good luck i had taken off my helmet and placed it at the foot of my hammock the rebels thought it was my head and every gun was blazing away at my poor helmet it was fairly riddled i can tell you i jumped out of the hammock and made for the bush but it was so thick and thorny the brutes caught me and beat me with sticks about the legs and feet so that i can scarcely walk as you see well it was my poor terrier dog that saved me for he came nosing after me but somehow took a wrong turn was fired on and wounded and went off whimpering into the bush in a different direction the ashantes followed my doggy thinking he was with me so i got away from them that night i wandered about trying to find the village where a kokufu chief was friendly to me as daylight came i heard natives talking and threw myself down under some leaves thinking it would be rather unpleasant to be taken and tortured well they came up saw the grass had been disturbed stopped examined found me i was done for no i was not i saw by their grinning and other signs that they were friendly in fact my carriers had told the friendly chief about me and he had sent these men to bring me back they had been looking for me all night they carried me back to esumasia where i stayed until the lagos houses came up on the twenty seventh of april next day the garrison of kumasi found that their rescuers had been compelled to abandon their rice and to fire away most of their ammunition on the road now there were two hundred and fifty more mouths to feed and food was running short rations were served out every morning and it was a very delicate operation for the loyal natives thought it a clever thing to steal a tin of beef or biscuits the biscuits and tinned meat had been stored four years in a tropical climate the meat tins were covered inside by a coating of green mold and the biscuits were either too hard to bite or were half eaten already by weevils captain middleton died on the sixth of may and when he was buried his boy muchi lay down on his master's grave like a faithful dog and sobbed bitterly that boy became a famous nurse they called him the rough diamond the poor refugees had now left the walls of the fort and had gone to their huts they looked so wan and piteous night after night there came a fearful noise of drumming from the rebel camps the loyal chiefs said the drums were beating out defiance and challenge to fight why not send for more white men ah why did they not come every day news came of a rescue column every night the rumor was proved false on the fifteenth of may about three thirty p m there was a terrific hubbub all round the fort officers rushed on to the veranda to see what was the matter hundreds of friendly natives were streaming along the north road what is it chief heavy loads of food coming in much eat much eat very good for belly in a few minutes the garrison saw a joyful sight major morris leading in his troops from the northern territories such a fine body of men all wearing the picturesque many-coloured straw hats of the north some of the officers were on ponies oh what shaking of hands what delightful chatter but they too had had to fight their way through several blockades and some were wounded the arrival of major morris writes lady hodson seems to take a load off our minds he was so cheery confident and resourceful and seemed always able to raise the spirits of the faint-hearted but the large loads of food did not in reality exist they had only brought enough to last a week they had however brought plenty of ammunition 
Major Morris was now in command of seven hundred and fifty of all ranks, and he resolved to make a reconnaissance in force. They went after the rebels far from the fort, and whilst they were away fighting, the wives of the refugees were doing a slow funeral dance up and down the road, chanting a mournful dirge, their faces and bodies daubed with white paint. In spite of this appeal to their gods, many wounded were carried back to the fort. Many a weary day came and went. No strong relief came, no news. The natives were dying of starvation, some went mad and shrieked, others sat still and picked their cloth to pieces. It was bad enough for all. A rat cost ten shillings. All pets had been eaten long ago. Then it was determined that the governor and Lady Hudson and some of the garrison should try to force their way to the coast, as there were only three days' supply of rations left. The 23rd of June was to be the day of departure. The governor's last words to the men left behind in the fort were, Well, you have a supply of food for twenty-three days, and are safe for that period, but we are going to die today captain bishop was left in command of the fort with a small force from captain bishop's report we learn that major morris had scarcely left kumasi when he saw a band of ashantes coming towards the fort from their stockade they thought no doubt that the fort had been deserted but the fire from the two maxims soon convinced them to the contrary the refugees who had built shelters round the walls had all with the exception of a hundred and fifty gone away with the governor's column but their empty shelters formed a pestilential area over them hovered vultures a sure proof of what some of them contained and one of the first duties of the little garrison was to burn them up after examining their contents the day after the column left three men died of starvation and almost daily one or more succumbed when no relief came as promised though they had been told it was only sixteen miles off their hopes fell and after ten days they gave up all hope of surviving but he says we kept up an appearance of cheerfulness for the sake of our men i regard the conduct of the native troops as marvellous they maintained perfect discipline and never complained some were too weak even to stand at the table to receive their rations and lay about on the ground all were worn to skin and bone but there were a few who to relieve their hunger had been eating poisonous herbs which caused great swellings of the body sometimes native women would come outside the fort and offer to sell food a penny piece of cocoa realized fifteen shillings bananas were eighteen pence each half a biscuit could be bought for three shillings this may give some idea of the scarcity of food on the fourteenth of july we heard terrific firing at four thirty p m hopes jumped up again but most of the men were too weak to care for anything it was very pathetic that now when relief was at hand some of the men were just at the point of death at four forty five amid the din of the ever approaching firing we heard ringing british cheers and a shell passed over the top of the fort we soon saw shells bursting in all directions about four hundred yards off, and we fired a maxim to show that we were alive. Then, to our intense relief, we heard a distant bugle sound the halt, and at six o'clock on this Sunday evening, the 15th of July, we saw the heads of the advance guard emerge from the bush with a fox terrier trotting gaily in front instantly the two buglers on the veranda sounded the welcome blowing it over and over again in their excitement a few minutes later a group of white helmets told us of the arrival of the staff and we rushed out of the fort cheering to the best of our ability the meeting with our rescuers was of a most affecting character colonel wilcox and his officers plainly showed what they had gone through the whole of the force was halted in front of the fort and three cheers for the queen and the waving of caps and helmets formed an evening scene that none of us will ever forget so they won through by pluck and patience thirty-three europeans and some seven hundred and twenty houses opposing many thousands of savage and cruel natives and what about the governor's party 
they stole away on the morning of the twenty third of june in a blue-white mist through the swamp and the clinging bush till they came to a stockade then they were seen by the ashantis who began to beat their tom-toms and drums signalling for help from other camps but they took the stockade and found beyond it a nice little camp before every hut a fire was burning and food cooking and no one to look after it many a square meal was hurriedly snatched and eaten but some who were too greedy and stayed behind to eat fell victims to the returning foe then came a terrible wrestling with bad roads and sniping blacks and a deluge of rain and most of their boxes were thrown away or lost of course there were many cases of theft on the third night two men were brought into the village in a dying state one of them was clasping in his hand a label taken from a bottle of scrubs ammonia they had broken open a box and finished the two bottles which they found there one was whiskey the other ammonia lady hodson writes one stream i remember well it was some thirty feet wide and flowing swiftly across it was a tree trunk very slippery how was i to get over the difficulty was solved by my cook carrying me over in his arms he was a tall man and managed to take me over safely but more than once he stumbled and i thought i would be dropped into the torrent often the road led through high reeds and long grass and many a time i thought we had lost our way and might suddenly emerge into some unfriendly village to be taken prisoners or cut down at last in quanta came in sight and perched on a hill we could see the union jack flying on a flagstaff in the centre of the town and the king's people drawn up to receive the governor we were at last among friends fires were burning everywhere and the cooking of food was the sole pursuit our poor starved houses had now before them the diet in which their hearts delighted it was a pleasant sight to see the joy with which they welcomed their altered prospects and the dispersal of the gloom which had so long rested upon all of us like a pall from lady hodson's akumasi by kind permission of messrs c arthur pearson limited end of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Mafeking, eighteen ninety nine, nineteen hundred. Snyman begins to fire. A flag of truce. Midnight sortie. The dynamite trolley. Kaffirs careless. A cattle raid. Elof nearly takes Mafeking. Is taken himself instead the relief dribble in at two a m come cannon with mahon and bloomer on the seventh of october eighteen ninety nine colonel baden powell issued a notice to the people of mafeking in which he told them that forces of armed boers are now massed upon the natal and bechuana land borders their orders are not to cross the border until the british fire a shot as this is not likely to occur at least for some time no immediate danger is to be apprehended it is possible they might attempt to shell the town and although every endeavour will be made to provide shelter for the women and children yet arrangements could be made to move them to a place of safety if they desire to go away from mafeking mafeking is situated upon a rise about three hundred yards north of the matopo river the railway which runs north to buluwayo is to the west of the town and crosses the river by an iron bridge to the west of the railway is the native stadt which consists of kaffir huts being called in kaffir language the place among the rocks the centre of the town is the market square from which bungalows built of mud bricks with roofs of corrugated iron extend regularly into the veldt the streets were barricaded and the houses protected by sandbags an armor-plated train fitted with quick-firing guns patrolled the railway at times the population during the siege included fifteen hundred whites and eight thousand natives the town was garrisoned by the Cape Police and by the Protectorate Regiment under Colonel Hoare, by the Town Guard and Volunteers. 
great was the excitement of the inhabitants as the day of bombardment drew near they had been very busy constructing earthworks and gun emplacements piling up tiers of sandbags and banks of earth to face them some had dug deep pits to sit in but at first such makeshifts were derided by the inexperienced it had been notified that a red flag would fly from headquarters if an attack were threatening together with an alarm bell rung in the centre of the town mines had been placed outside the town and a telephone attached commandant schneiman had prophesied that when he did begin to bombard mafeking english heads would roll on the veldt like marbles mafeking had no artillery to speak of so no wonder that many hearts felt uneasy tremors as the fatal monday drew near yet curiosity ofttimes overcame fear and many coins of vantage were chosen by those who wished to climb up and see the gory sport the bombardment began at nine fifteen a m and the first shell sank in a sand heap and forgot to explode the second and third fell short but not very short then came shell after shell falling into street or back yard and exploding with a bang numbers rushed to find out what damage had been done then grins stole across surprised faces the area of damage was about three square feet three shells fell into the hospital luckily doing no harm to any one after some hours of terrible thundering cannon fire it suddenly ceased the garrison counted up their casualties three buildings had been struck the hospital the monastery and riesel's hotel one life had been taken it was a pullet that had never yet laid an egg shortly after this bill of butchery had been presented the boer general sent an emissary to colonel baden powell commandant schneiman presents his compliments and desires to know if to save further bloodshed the english would now surrender baden powell is a great actor he never smiled as he replied tell the commandant with my compliments that we have not yet begun but a few days later the boers were seen to be very active on the veldt about three miles from the town and the rumour spread that they had sent to pretoria for siege guns the townsfolk stood in groups and discussed the new peril about noon next day the red flag flew from headquarters presently a great cloud of smoke rose on the skyline then came a rush of air a roar as of some great bird flying a terrific concussion and then flying fragments of steel buried themselves in distant buildings creating a sense of terror throughout the town mafeking is doomed was the general cry that afternoon those alone who had dug themselves deep pits were fairly comfortable in their minds the second shot of the big cruiset gun wrecked the rear of the mafeking hotel and the force of the explosion hurled the war correspondent of the chronicle upon a pile of wood next day more than two hundred shells were thrown into mafeking which was saved by its mud walls where bricks would have shattered and shaken these walls only threw out a cloud of dust as the boers began to construct trenches round the city captain fitzclarence was ordered to make a midnight sortie shortly after eleven o'clock the little party started on their perilous expedition they crept on over the veldt in extended order noiseless as possible nearer and nearer to the boer entrenchments those who watched them felt the weirdness of the scene the deep silence the mysterious noises of the veldt the shadows caused by the bush now they were within a few yards as they fixed bayonets they rushed forward with a cheer then figures showed in the boer position shots rang out horses neighed and stampeded in fright the boers taken by surprise were unsteady and panic-stricken not many in the first trenches resisted long and stubbornly captain fitzclarence a splendid swordsman laid four boers who faced him on the ground his men pursued with the bayonet bota said next day that they thought a thousand men had been hurled against them and the boers in the other trenches fired as fast as they could at anything they could see or not see many of the bullets going as far as the town this useless firing went on for a long time 
when the attacking party arrived at the town again they found that they had lost only six men eleven wounded and two taken prisoners next day the boers fired no gun until evening and had plenty to do in collecting their wounded several such night attacks were made in order to check the boers advance after six weeks of siege colonel baden powell said in a published order provisions are not yet scarce danger is purely incidental and everything in the garden is lovely he was always trying to cheer up his little garrison with humorous speeches and funny doings with concerts and dances and theatrical entertainments it was the knowledge of what he had done to keep up the spirits of his men and the spirits of englishmen at home which caused such a frenzy of delight when maffa king was finally relieved what seemed a madness of joy was a sure instinct in the nation it is true that maffa king through the foresight of julius vile the contractor possessed immense stocks of food but as to its defences dummy camps and dummy earthenworks built to affright the boers would not have availed unless the loyalty and bravery of the colonists had been equal to the severest strain there was a wild desire to spike big ben but the crusade was hedged round by barbed wire guarded by mines and flanked by nordenfeldt guns it seemed wearisome work week after week to find the boers standing away four or five miles while from their places of safety they launched their shells sometimes in the night baden powell would go forth alone and creep or stand and examine and ferret out the plans of the enemy often as he returned he would startle some dozing sentry even as the great napoleon who once found a sentry asleep and shouldered his musket until the fellow awoke with a start i will not tell but don't do it again seven weary weeks have passed and maffa king still endures the straits of a siege and the terrors of a bombardment the boers have summoned to their aid the finest guns from their arsenal in pretoria to breach and pound the earthenworks they pour shot and shell into the little town but everybody is living below ground now but they have bethought them of a new engine of terror and death all was dark outside the good folk in mafeking were going to bed in peace when a deafening roar shook the town to its foundation of rock a lurid glow of blood-red fire lit up square and street and veldt while pattering down on roofs of corrugated iron dropped a hailstorm of sand and stones and twigs broken from many trees the frightened folk ran out to see what had happened and they saw a huge column of fire and smoke rising from the ground to the north of mafeking after the great roar of explosion came a weird silence and then the rattle of falling fragments on roof after roof and then the cry of terror the shriek of those who had been aroused from sleep to face the great trumpet call of the day of judgment for this they imagined that awful phenomenon to portend it was not until the morning that they knew what had caused the alarm about half a mile up the line the ground was rent and torn the rails were bent and scattered and flung about as by an earthquake on inquiry they found that the boers had filled a trolley with dynamite and were to impel it forwards towards maffa king they lit the time fuse and proceeded to push the trolley up a slight incline a few yards further and it would reach the down incline and would run merrily into town without need of further aid from muscle of man but they gave over pushing a little too soon the trolley began to run back and it was so dark they did not realize it until it had gathered way then they called to one another and some pushed but others remembered the time fuse and stood aloof with their mouths open very soon the time fuse met the charge and the dynamite hastened to work all the evil it could regardless of friend or foe piet Cronje was in command of the boers now he was vexed by this unlucky accident but threatened to send to pretoria for dynamite guns just to make this absurd veldt city jump and squeal Cronje was willing to ride up and storm maffa king but the idle braggarts who formed the greater part of his army dared not face the steel yet there was more than one lady in the trenches able and ready to use her rifle 
the natives had suffered more from shell-fire than the whites it is not easy to impress the kaffir mind with the peril of a bursting shell though the kaffir may have helped to build bomb-proof shelters for europeans yet for himself and his family he thinks a dugout pit too costly and will lie about under a tarpaulin or behind a wooden box until the inevitable explosion some day sends him and his family into the air in fragments one such victim was heard to murmur feebly as they put him on the stretcher boss boss me hurt belly they bear pain very stoically and turn their brown pathetic eyes on those who come to help them much as a faithful hound will look in his master's face for sympathy when in the agony of death there were so many shells that missed human life that the people grew careless and ventured out too often late in november a local wheelwright thought he would extract the charge from a boer shell which had not exploded the good man used a steel drill for a time all went well and his two companions bent over to watch the operation then came a hideous row a smell a smoke and the wheelwright with both his comrades was hurled into space the boers had not spared the hospital or the convent the poor sisters had had a fearful time the children's dormitory was in ruins and their home riddled with holes still the brave sisters stuck to their post comforted the dying nursed the sick and set an example of holy heroism here is an extract from a letter describing a scene with the kaffirs it is amusing to take a walk into the stadt the place of rocks and watch the humours of the kaffirs some eight thousand in number now and then they hold a meeting when their attire is a funny mixture of savagery and semi-civilization you come upon a man wearing a fine pair of check trousers and nothing else but mighty proud of his check another will wear nothing but a coat with the sleeves tied round his neck some wear hats adorned with an ostrich feather and a small loin-cloth my black friend was such a swell among them that he wore one of my waistcoats a loin-cloth and a pair of tennis shoes he wore the waistcoat in order to disport a silver chain to which was attached an old watch that refused to go but it was a very valuable ornament to setseti and won him great influence in the kraal yet when my friend setseti wanted to know the time of day if he was alone he just glanced at the shadow of a tree or if in company he lugged out his non-ticker and made believe to consult it in conjunction with the sun the sun might be wrong that was the impression he wished to create and it was perhaps more prudent to correct solar time by this relic of ludgate circus thus said seti like other prominent politicians did not disdain to play upon the credulity of his compatriots sometimes on a sunday afternoon when the boers were keeping the sabbath and no shells were flying around the children of the veldt would begin a dance they formed into groups of forty or fifty and began with hand clapping jumping and stamping of bare feet the old crones came capering around grinning and shrieking delight in high voices apt to crack for age from stamping the young girls passed on to swaying bodies every limb vibrating with rising emotions as they flung out sinewy arms with languorous movement then more wild grew the dance more loud the cries of the dancers as they threw themselves into striking postures glided shifted retreated laughed or cried i had been watching them for some time when setseti came up to me and said boz i go now to mark some cows for to-night will you come what has the big white chief given you leave to make a raid i asked yes marina yes we are to go out to-night and bring in a herd from beyond the brickfields yonder if we can and you go now this afternoon to mark them down and spy out the ground he smiled showing a set of splendid teeth pulled out his watch hid it back and forth with his knuckles till it rattled to the very centre of the works spat carefully and replied with some pride we brought in twenty oxen last week the chief very pleased with us and gave us a nice share marina setseti addressed me thus when he was pleased with himself and the universe marina means sir well setseti said i if i can get leave i would like to go out with you to-night may i bring my boy malasata 
the idea of my asking his permission gave setseti such a lift up in his own opinion of himself that he actually reflected with his chin in the air before he finally gave his royal assent to my proposition time and place were settled and i went back to the club for a wash these black chaps if they don't help us much in fighting have proved themselves very useful in providing us now and then with rich juicy beef from the boer herds that stray about the veldt when i went home and told malasata he was to accompany me to-night on a cattle raiding foray like a true kaffir he concealed his delight and only said aha aha unkos but he could not prevent his great brown eyes from sparkling with pleasure when it was pitch dark we started about a score of us and crept along silently past the outpost word having been passed that the raiders were to go and come with a kaffir password or countersign most of the kaffirs were stark naked the better to evade the grasp of any boar who might clutch at them a sergeant had been told off to accompany them he and i were the only white men out that night after an hour's careful climbing and crawling stopping to listen and feel the wind the better to gauge our direction setseti came close to my ear and whispered we can smell them boss plenty good smell you and sergeant stay here sit down wait a bit boots too much hullabaloo too loud talky it was disappointing but we quite saw the need of this caution and we neither of us saw the necessity of walking barefoot upon a stony veldt so we sat down in the black silence and waited yet it was not so silent as it seemed we could hear the bullfrogs croaking a mile away in the river bed and sometimes a distant tinkle of a cowbell came to us on the soft breeze or a meerkat rustled in the grass after a partridge in about half an hour we heard something was it a reed buck then came the falling of a stone the crackling of a stick as it broke under their tread then we rose and walked towards our black friends three or four kaffirs were shepherding each ox getting a move on him by persuasion or fist law sometimes one ox would be restive and moo to his mates or gallop wildly hither and thither but always the persistent ubiquitous kaffir kept in touch with his beast talking to him softly like a man and a brother and guiding him the way he should go and all this time the boars were snoring not three hundred yards off sentry and all very probably but it would not do to count upon their negligence any indiscreet noise might awake a trench full of mauser armed men and bring upon us a volley of death when we had got the cattle well out of earshot of the boer lines the kaffirs urged on the oxen by running up and pinching them but without uttering a sound as we drew near to the native stadt a great number of natives who had been lying concealed in the veldt rose up to help their friends drive the raided cattle into the enclosure and the sergeant went to headquarters with the report of twenty-four head of cattle safely housed the besieged had persevered in their dugouts until may nineteen hundred being weary and sometimes sick faint with poor food and hopes blighted they had been asked by lord roberts to endure a little longer kimberley had been relieved and their turn would come soon meanwhile president kruger's nephew commandant Ilof, had come into the boer camp with men who had once served as troopers at mafeking and who knew much about the fortifications Elof made a skilful attack upon the town on the twelfth of may and was successful in capturing a fort colonel hoare and twenty-three men this attack had been urgent because news had reached the boers that the british relief column had reached vryburg on the tenth of may and vryburg is only ninety-six miles south of mafeking during the fight mr j a hamilton not knowing that the fort had been taken thought that he would ride across to see colonel hoare it was a short ride from where he was only a few hundred yards the bullets whistled near his head and he scampered across the open to reach cover it was a bad light and smoke was drifting about but he saw men standing about the headquarters or sitting on the stoop facing the town as he rode his horse was struck and swerved violently someone seized his bridle and shouted surrender 
they were boers and amongst them were germans italians and frenchmen many speaking at once they ordered him to hold up his hands give up his revolver get off his horse we had better all take cover i think said hamilton as english bullets were falling rather near them then they took him within the walls but he had not yet obeyed any of their orders will you hold your hands up said one boer thrusting a rifle into his ribs with a grin with pleasure under the circumstances he replied trying to smile will you kindly hand over that revolver said another what and hold my hands up at the same time they were dull they did not see the joke but shouted oh, get off some one unstrapped the girths and mr hamilton rolled to the ground it was only then that he saw his horse had been shot in the shoulder and he asked them to put the poor beast out of his pain no no your men will do that soon enough said they the poor animal stood quietly looking at him as he says with a sad pathetic inquiring look in his eyes as if he were asking what can you do for me i assure you my shoulder gives me awful pain hamilton was taken inside the fort and made prisoner when later in the day he came out he found his poor horse lying with his throat cut and seven bullet wounds in his body there were thirty-three prisoners crowded in a small ill-ventilated storeroom and they grew very hungry as dusk settled down they began to hear echoes of desperate fighting outside bullets came through the wall and roofing splintering window and door through the grating of the windows they could see limping figures scurry and scramble they heard voices cursing them and urging eloff to handcuff and march the prisoners across the line of fire as a screen for them in their retreat then the firing died down and the boers seemed to have rallied then came a fresh outburst of heavy firing and then a sudden silence eloff rushed to the door where is colonel hoar here sir if you can induce the town to cease fire we will surrender it was quite unexpected this turn of events no one spoke then eloff said i give myself up as a hostage get them to cease fire the prisoners went out waved handkerchiefs and shouted surrender cease fire boys when this was done sixty-seven boers laid down their rifles and the prisoners stacked them up in their late prison commandant eloff was now a prisoner instead of being master of mafeking his partial success he owed to his own dash and gallantry his failure to the half-hearted support of general snyman he dined at headquarters and a bottle of champagne was opened to console him and distinguish this day of surprises on the sixteenth of may there was great excitement in the town the great activity in the boer loggers the clouds of dust rising in the south all showed that something new and strange was coming news had come of general mahon having joined colonel plumer a few miles up the river when will they come everybody was asking about half past two general mahon's guns were heard and the smoke of the bursting shells could be seen in the northwest in the town people were taking things very calmly had they not enjoyed this siege now for seven months when it had been expected to last three weeks at the most they were playing off the final match in the billiard tournament in the club then came a hubbub and major pancera galloped by with the guns to get a parting shot at the retiring boers then fell the dusk and the guns came back everybody went to dinner very elated and happy by noon to-morrow we shall be relieved they said it was now about seven o'clock the moon was shining brightly in the square hello what's this who are you then there were eight mounted men sitting on horseback outside the headquarters office who are you and what do you want asked a man in the crowd we are under major carrie davis with a dispatch from general mahon oh yes we've come to relieve you fellows but you don't seem to care much whether you are relieved or not then the news travelled round the town a great crowd gathered and round after round of cheers broke out the troopers were surrounded by enthusiastic citizens cross questions congratulated slapped on the back shaken by the hand and offered coffee major davis came out and called for cheers for the garrison then all fell to hallooing of such anthems as rule britannia and god save the queen 
then the troopers of the imperial light horse were taken in to supper about two in the morning the troops entered mafeking not quite two thousand men but when the townsfolk hearing the noise ran out into the starry moonlit night they saw such a host of horses mules and bullocks such a line of wagons and camp followers and such a beautiful battery of bright royal horse and canadian artillery and maxims that life seemed worth living at last those who did not laugh quietly went home and cried for joy they had earned their day of delight maffa king had endured one thousand four hundred and ninety eight shells from the one hundred pound creaset besides this they had had to dodge twenty one thousand odd shells of smaller calibre men who saw ladysmith said that the ruin at maffa king was far greater lord roberts had with his wonted generosity sent a mob of prime bullocks and a convoy of other luxuries so when the queen's birthday came as it soon did the town made merry and were very thankful england was thankful too for although it was only a little town on the veldt every eye at home had been upon the brave defenders who out of so little material had produced so grand a defence it is not too much to say that colonel baden powell and his gallant company had not only kept the flag flying they had done far more they had kept up the spirits of a nation beginning to be humiliated by defeat after defeat when most of the nations of europe were jeering at her and wishing for her downfall but god gave us victory in the end in part from j a hamilton's siege of mafeking by kind permission of messrs methuen and company end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four the siege of kimberley eighteen ninety nine to nineteen hundred the diamond mines cecil rhodes comes in streets barricaded colonel kekowich sends out the armoured train water got from the de beers company's mines a job of shells de beers can make shells too milner's message beef or horse long cecil labram killed shelter down the mines a capture of dainties major rogers adventures general french comes to the rescue outposts astonished to see lancers and new zealanders kimberley is the second largest town in cape colony and is the great diamond mining district having a population of about twenty five thousand whites mr cecil rhodes was the chairman of the de beers mines company which pays over a million a year in wages kimberley could not at first believe war to be possible between the dutch and english though they saw the regular troops putting up earthworks and loopholed forts all around the town next a town guard was formed to man the forts while the six hundred regulars and artillery were to be camped in a central position ready for emergencies cecil rhodes arrived the last day the railway was open and began at once to raise a regiment at his own expense the kimberley light horse all the streets were blocked with barricades and barbed wires to prevent the boers rushing in the main streets had a narrow opening left in the centre guarded by volunteers who had orders to let none pass without a signed permit rhodes used to ride far out on the veldt dressed in white flannel trousers though the boers hated him and would dearly have liked to pot him at a safe distance Colonel Kekowich was in command, a man of Devon, and very popular with his men. On the 24th of October they had their first taste of fighting, when a patrol came across a force of boars who were out with the object of raiding the De Beers cattle. Kekowich, from his conning tower, could see his men in difficulties, and sent out the armoured train, and the boars were speedily dispersed. There were many wounded on both sides, and the Mauser bullet was found to be able to drill a neat hole through bone and muscle, in some cases without doing so much damage as the old bullets of lower velocity in earlier wars at the beginning of the siege it was feared that water might fail but in three weeks the de beers company had contrived to supply the town with water from an underground stream in one of their mines 
the bombardment began on the seventh of november and as at mafeking did not do much damage for the shells being fired from spyfontein four miles away and being a job lot supplied to the transvaal government did not often reach the houses and often forgot to burst so that it is said an irish policeman hearing a shell explode in the street near him remarked calmly to himself the blazes and what will they be playing at next but by the eleventh the boers had brought their guns nearer had found the range and were becoming a positive nuisance to quiet citizens sunday was a day of rest and no shelling took place but on other days it began at daylight and with pauses for meals and a siesta continued till nine or ten o'clock at night as usual there were extraordinary escapes one shell just missed the dining-room of the queen's hotel where a large company were at dinner and choosing the pantry close beside it killed two cats luckily there was time between the sound of the gun and the arrival of the shell to get into cover the de beers company having many clever engineers and artisans soon began to make their own shells which had with c j r s compliments stamped upon them rather a grim jest when they did arrive on the twenty eighth november colonel scott turner who commanded the mounted men was killed in a sortie he was a very brave but rather reckless officer and was shot dead close to the boer fort sometimes our own men would go out alone spying and sniping and in many cases they were shot by their own comrades by mistake by december the milk farms outside the town had been looted and fresh milk began to be very scarce even tinned milk could not be bought without a doctor's order countersigned by the military officer who was in charge of the stores the result was that many young children died at christmas sir alfred milner sent a message to kimberley wishing them a lucky christmas this gave the garrison matter for thought and the townsfolk wondered if england had forgotten their existence those who could spent some time and care on their gardens for they tried to find a nice change from wurzels to beet and even beans and lettuce for scurvy the consequence of eating too much meat without green stuff had already threatened the town those who wanted food had to go to the market hall and fetch it showing a ticket which mentioned how many persons were to be supplied when horse flesh first began to be used by the officers colonel peakman presiding at mess said cheerfully gentlemen very sorry we can't supply you all with beef to-day beef this end very nice joint of horse the other end please try it but the officers all applied for beef as the colonel had feared they would then suddenly when all had finished he banged his hand on the table and said by jove i see i have made a mistake in the joints this is the capital joint of horse which i am carving dear dear i wanted so to taste the horse but what not so bad after all then you will forgive me i am sure for being so stupid all the same some of them thought that the colonel had made the mistake on purpose just to get them past the barrier of prejudice towards the end of january the bombardment grew more severe the shells came from many quarters and some were shrapnel which caused many wounds the new gun made by the de beers company did its best to reply but it was only one against eight or nine the boers confessed that they directed their fire to the centre of the town where there were mostly only women and children for the men were away from home in the forts or behind the earthworks the townsfolk tried to improve their shell-proof places but most of them were deadly holes hot and stuffy beyond description but that made by mr rhodes around the public gardens was far superior to the rest the de beers gun was named long cecil after mr rhodes and was about ten feet long Long. it threw a shell weighing twenty-eight pounds when it was first fired the great question was will it burst but the boers were surprised when they sat at breakfast in a safe spot to hear shells dropping around like ripe apples that breakfast was left unfinished as an intercepted letter informed the garrison however the boers soon placed a bigger gun near kimberley and the shells began to fall in the market-place very freely in february the garrison had a great loss the last shell of that day fell into the grand hotel and killed george labram the de beers chief engineer
it was labram who had arranged for the new water supply who had made the new shells and planned long cecil he was to kimberley what kondrachenko was to the russians at port arthur a man of many inventions an american ready at all points he had just gone upstairs to wash before dinner when a shell entered and cut him to ribbons so that he died instantly a servant of the hotel was in his room at the time and was not touched towards the middle of february notices signed by cecil rhodes were posted up all over the town to the effect that women and children should take shelter in the two big mines so very soon the streets were full of people running to the mines with babies blankets bread and bedding the crowd was so great that it took from five thirty p m to midnight to lower them all down the shafts kimberley mine took more than a thousand the de beers mine fifteen hundred and all were lowered without a single accident one day some natives came in with a story that the boers had deserted the fort alexander's fontaine spies were sent out to investigate and reported it to be a fact so some of the town guard with help from the lancashires sallied out and took possession of the fort a few boers who had been left there were wounded or taken prisoners we will wait a bit in this fort boys to see what will turn up said the captain and in a short time they saw four wagons coming up which were driven unsuspiciously right into their hands other wagons followed all full of most delicious dainties for boar stomachs but likely to be received in starving kimberley with great enthusiasm such things as poultry grain butter fresh vegetables and bacon the wagons were drawn by fat bullocks a sight for mirth and jollity in the afternoon the poor boars knew what they had missed and some very spiteful bullets were sent across for several hours major roger had sent some men to spy out the country and was waiting for their return presently he saw two men advancing towards him and thinking they were his own men he rode up to them on drawing near he saw they were boars his main body of men were far behind and he realized that if he galloped away he would be shot so he quietly walked his horse up to them one of the boars said who are you only one of the fighting men from kimberley the major replied they did not draw their revolvers they did not cry hands up and seize him by the collar no all they did was to utter a brief swear turn their horses heads and scamper over the veldt as fast as they could stooping over the pommel to avoid the major's fire but half a mile away they hit upon some of their own comrades fired a few volleys broke the major's arm and retired major roger however had not done his day's work and never told his men he had been shot until they returned to kimberley in the evening so much for a kimberley volunteer meanwhile the little folks and the women deep down in the mine some fifteen hundred feet were busy devouring sandwiches of corned beef and horse and buckets of tea and coffee with condensed milk were lowered down too the large chamber cut out of the rock was lit with electric light and was not very hot though it was crammed with children many of whom were lying on rugs or blankets they lay so thick on the floor that walking amongst them was the feet of an acrobat but they were safe down there no ghastly sights of mangled limbs met their gaze no whiz of deadly shell no screams of pain reached them there it was worth something to have escaped the horrors of a siege and to feel no nervous tremors no cowardly panic and no dull despair meanwhile lord roberts had not forgotten kimberley a force of some five thousand sabres led by general french with two batteries of horse artillery had galloped in the dead of night to the modder river here a small boar force fled from before them and ever on through the quivering heat rode hussars dragoons and lancers until both men and horses fell out exhausted on the veld on the third day they came close to some kopjes or hills on which boars were posted who stared in amazement at the sight of the ninth lancers sweeping in open order round the base of the hills a hundred miles they had ridden with scant food and scanter water so that the boars might have been still more surprised to see many a trooper walking by his tired steed and even carrying the saddle <laughs> 
dr conan doyle tells us that a skirmish was in progress on the fifteenth of february between a party of the kimberley light horse and some boars when a new body of horsemen unrecognized by either side appeared upon the plain and opened fire upon the enemy one of the strangers rode up to the kimberley patrol and said what the dickens does k l h mean on your shoulder strap it means kimberley light horse who are you i am one of the new zealanders how puzzled that member of the kimberley force must have been a new zealander out on the african veldt soon the little clouds of dust on the horizon drew hundreds of townsfolk to the earthworks and as the glint of spearhead and scabbard flashed out of the cloud and the besieged garrison knew their troubles were over men waved their hats and shouted and tearful laughing ladies flocked round the first men who rode in and nearly pulled them out of the saddle then they set to and hauled the rest out of the mines finishing that job well by midnight for a hundred and twenty-four days kimberley had been besieged the boers had never once attacked the town though not more than five hundred and fifty mounted men were latterly available for offensive work these with the town guard lancashires and kimberley rifles made a total of three thousand seven hundred and sixty-four colonel kekowich might well look radiantly happy he had administered everything with strict justice and had earned the respect and admiration of all while cecil rhodes and the de beers officials had magnificently met and countered every difficulty with generous skill and unflagging energy end of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of the Romance of Modern Sieges by Edward Gilliatt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five The Siege of Ladysmith, eighteen ninety nine, nineteen hundred. Ladysmith, Humours of the Shell, The Liar Tries to Be Funny, Attack on Long Tom, A Brave Bugler, Practical Jokes, The Black Postman, A Big Trek, Last Shots, Some One Comes, Saved at Last ladysmith where sir george white and his men detained the boar so long is a scattered town lying on a lake-like plain and surrounded by an amphitheatre of rocky hills to the northwest was pepworth hill where the boar long tom was placed northeast of the town and four miles away was unbulwana here the boars had dragged a large siege gun south of the town the clip river runs close under the hills and here many caves were dug as hiding places for the residents there were many women and children there all day long on the third of november the wires were cut ladysmith was isolated and besieged on the next day it was discussed whether general joubert's proposal should be accepted that the civilians women and children should go out and form a camp five miles off under the white flag archdeacon barker got up and said our women and children shall stay with the men under the union jack and those who would do them harm may come to them at their peril the meeting cheered the tall white-haired priest and agreed there too the townsfolk soon got used to shell fire but they spent most of the day by the river in their cool caves there was a dr stark a visitor from torquay who used to go about with a fishing rod and spend hours by the river a kindly man who one day found a cat mewing piteously at a deserted house and making friends with it used to carry it about with him this gentleman having the cat in his arms was standing near the door of the royal hotel talking to mr McHugh, when a shell came through the roof passed through two bedrooms and whizzed out at the front door catching the poor doctor just above the knees his friend escaped without a scratch dr stark had always tried to avoid the peril of shells and they used to banter him on his over anxiety it is strange how many hits and how many misses are in the nature of a surprise late in november a shell entered a room in which a little child was sleeping and knocked one of the walls of the bedroom clean out in the cloud of dust and smoke the parents heard a cry of the little babe rushed in and found her absolutely untouched while twenty yards away a splinter of the same shell killed a man of the natal police at the same house later in the evening two friends called to congratulate the mother they were being shown two pet rabbits when a splinter of a shell came in and cut in two one of the rabbits 
one day a natal mounted rifleman was lying in his tent stretched himself yawned and turned over at that instant a shell struck the spot where he had just been lying made a hole in the ground and burst the tent was blown away from its ropes his pillow and clothes were tossed into the air poor fellow his comrades ran towards him and found him sitting up pale but unharmed they could hardly believe their senses why man you ought to have been blown to smithereens another day a trooper of the eighteenth hussars was rolled over horse and all yet neither of them suffered any severe injury december came and by then the poor women were looking harassed and worn so many grievous sights so many perils to try and avoid so many losses to weep over some of the correspondents brought out a local paper the ladysmith liar to enliven the spirits of the dull and timid and sick the news may be sampled by the following extracts november fourteen general french has twice been seen in ladysmith disguised as a kafir his force is entrenched behind bulwen hurrah november twenty h m s powerful ran aground in attempting to come up clip river feared a total loss clip river is two feet deep in parts november twenty one we hear on good authority that the gunner of long tom is dreyfus november twenty six boars broke sabbath firing on our bathing parties believed so infuriated by sight of people washing that they quite forgot it was sunday the ladysmith liar had come out three times before december on the seventh of december at ten p m four hundred men who had volunteered for the task were ordered to turn out carrying rifles and revolvers only and to make no noise a small party of engineers were to be with them their object was to destroy long tom which was now removed from pepworth to lombard's cop on the northeast they started when the moon went down on a fine starlit night by a quarter to two a m they were close to the foot of lombard's cop but the boer pickets had not been alarmed general hunter who led them explained how one hundred of the imperial light horse and one hundred of the carbineers would steal up the mountain and take the boer guns while two hundred of the border mounted on foot would go round the hill to protect their comrades from a flank attack the engineers carrying gun cotton and tools followed close after the storming party as our men were creeping quietly up the hill on hands and knees amazed that there were no outposts a sudden challenge rang out behind them Ve comdar had the boer sentry been dreaming in the drowsy night this pronounced v comdar v comdar he impatiently shouted our men sat down on the slope above him grinning to themselves and made no answer v comdar he was getting angry and frightened this time by the tone of it take that fellow in the wind with the butt of a rifle and stop his mouth then the boar knew who they were and yelled to his comrades for help then they heard him say to his after rider bring my pet my horse and he was safely off further up the hill a shrill voice shouted martinez car joubert de rovenec the redneck at this our men clambered up like goats while a volley was fired and the bullets whizzed over their heads stick to me guides shouted general hunter as they neared the top colonel edwards of the volunteers shouted now then boys fix bayonets and give them a taste of the steel this was meant for the dutchman to hear for there was not a bayonet amongst the assaulting party the boers did not like cold steel and they were heard slithering and stumbling down the other side of the mountain now they were up on the top there stood long tom pointing at high heaven loaded ready and laid to a range of eight thousand yards or over four miles not a boar was to be seen or heard anywhere quickly the engineers got to work some removed the breech block others filled the barrel with gun cotton plugged both muzzle and breech and ran a pretty necklace of gun cotton round the dainty ribs of the barrel long tom was looking quite unconscious of their attentions and shone in the starlight he had been set on solid masonry and was mounted on high iron wheels and a short railway line had been laid down for purposes of locomotion 
a thick bomb-proof arch was built over him and huge pyramids of shells were piled up round about him a howitzer and a field gun which stood close by were then destroyed and a maxim was reserved to be brought away in about twenty minutes the engineers announced that they were ready like goats they had swarmed about him and now it was long tom's turn to say bah the firing fuse was attached keep back keep back there was heard a dull roar from the monster and the whole mountain flared out with a flash as if of lightning had the gun cotton done its work they ran back to inspect barrel rent sir part of the muzzle torn away long tom has fired his last shot the ladies of ladysmith will be very thankful for this small favor the men came back most of them carrying small trophies down they scrambled no barbed wire no impediments who would have thought that these english would stir out of night had they no desire to sleep and rest but when they got down they found some had been wounded major henderson had been hit twice thumb almost torn away and a couple of slugs in his thigh yet he had never halted and was the first to tackle the gun a few privates were also hit but only one so seriously as to be left behind in care of a surgeon great rejoicing at breakfast and congratulations from sir george white but the time wore on and sickness came far worse and more fatal than shell fire there were hundreds of fever patients in the hospital outside at entombe spreet fever typhoid enteric and no stimulants no jellies no beef tea the only luxury was a small ration of tinned milk scores of convalescents died of sheer starvation the doctors were overworked and they too broke down no wonder that many in the garrison chafed at inaction found fault with their superiors and asked bitterly are we to stay here till we rot by new year's eve ladysmith had endured some eight thousand rounds of shell many buildings had been hit half a dozen times on new year's day an officer of the lancers was sleeping in his house when a shell exploded and buried him in a heap of timber when they pulled the mess off him he sat up rubbed the dust out of his eyes and asked what o'clock is it he was unhurt there was a small bugler of the fifth lancers who was the envy of every boy in the town this boy was in the battle at elan's lacte and when a regiment seemed wavering he sounded the call the advance the charge the result was that the regiment faced the music and did valiantly a general rode up to the bugler after the fight and took his name saying you are a plucky boy i shall report you for this boy after sounding the charge had drawn his revolver rode into the thick of the fight on his colonel's flank and shot three boars one after the other scores of officers gave the boy a sovereign for his pluck and he wore his cap all through the siege in a very swagger fashion some of the regiments had their pet dogs in ladysmith when the king's royals went into action the regimental dog went with them he had never been out of the fighting line and had never had a scratch but seemed to enjoy the fun of barking and looking back saying come on faster there was another a little red mongrel who insisted on seeing every phase of warfare he had lost a leg in india it was so smashed up that the doctor had to cut it off there he was pottering about on three legs full of inquisitive ardor and when not engaged on sanitary inspection work always to the front when the guns were at it this was the hussar's dog the boers were fond of playing practical jokes on christmas day they had fired a shell containing a plum pudding into the artillery camp on the hundred and first day of the siege one of the boers on bulwana hill called up the signalers at caesar's camp and flashed the message a hundred and one not out the manchesters flashed back lady smith still batting what is the use of shelling these britishers once said a boer artilleryman they just go on playing cricket look yonder ah but that was in the early days of the siege when they had some strength in them later after having short rations of horse flesh they could scarcely creep from hill to hill another day a heliograph message came how do you like horse meat fine was the answer when the horses are finished we shall eat baked boar 
it became very difficult to get letters through the boar pickets they had so many ways of trapping the native runners the kaffir paths were watched bell wires were doubled one placed close to the ground the other at the height of a man's head when the kaffir touched one of these an electric bell rang on one of the kopjes or hills and swarms of guards swooped down to intercept him but the kaffir being paid fifteen pounds a journey did his best too he left the outer line of our pickets at dusk and flitted away silently to the nearest native kraal he handed in the letters to the black chief and wandered on empty-handed towards general buller's camp meanwhile a simple kaffir girl would pass the boer camp calabash on head going to fetch water from the spring in the early morning the letters were in the empty water vessel she put them under a stone by the spring and another maiden would come from the other side and take them on in her calabash or mealie jar at last the native runner would call for them and carry the letters to the english lines on the sixteenth of january a determined attack was made by the pick of the boers upon caesar's camp our pickets in buller's relieving army could hear the sound of the guns muffled by distance officers and men gathered in groups on the hillsides and listened intently to the long low growl of the rifle then came a helio message from sir george white to general cleary attacked on every side the nervous strain on these men condemned to inaction after each new failure to cross the tugela and fight their way into ladysmith became almost insupportable they sat outside the big camp gazing at bulwana with telescopes and field glasses hardly daring to utter their thoughts a second helio was flashed across enemy everywhere repulsed fighting continues then tongues were once more loosened and hope arose as the distant firing sank to a sullen minute gun but half an hour later the booming of big guns on bulwana was renewed and away to the west arose a fierce rifle fire attack renewed enemy reinforced winked the helio from the top of convent hill and again a dumb despair fell on the watchers very hard pressed came the third message firing our soldiers with indignant rage as they thought of the poor part they had hitherto taken in relieving ladysmith but at length the heroism of the devons the imperial light horse and others of the ladysmith garrison beat back the boar's desperate assault the devons had climbed up the hill late in the afternoon to avenge their fallen comrades they had charged straight up the hill in a line but a deadly fire at short range brought down dozens of them as they rushed the top however there was no wavering in the devons but they pressed forward at the double with the steel advanced and only a few boars waited for that disagreeable operation in war there was a terrible hailstorm going on as colonel park halted his men just below the crest it was a moment to try the nerves of the strongest once over that lip of hillside and a fiercer storm than hail would meet them in the face and call many of them to their last account no wonder many a hand went for the water bottle and little nervous tricks of foot and hand betrayed the tension of the moment now then devons get ready the men gripped their rifles in the old way of drill quick and all together brows were knit teeth set and away they went into the jaws of death steady devons steady no need to bid them be steady they bore down upon the boars with dogged and irresistible force and the boars turned and ran many an english officer fell that day and several doctors were wounded while doing their duty the boers who fought most fiercely were the old dopper boers who nursed a bitter hatred for all englishmen these men would refuse all kind help even when lying hurt they were suspected sometimes of cruelty to our wounded for more than one of our men was found covered with bruises as though he had been kicked or beaten to death but these things were exceptional and such conduct was confined to the most ignorant and uncivilized of the old boers many of the wounded lay where they fell for twenty-four hours and more the kaffir boys as they dug the long shallow graves would hum a low refrain above wheeled the vultures looking down upon the slain the boers confessed that it was the worst day they had ever had and five days after the battle they were still searching for their dead our dead numbered about a hundred and fifty 
the imperial light horse containing many young englishmen in their ranks greatly distinguished themselves the brigadier commanding in the fight wrote to their chief officer no one realizes more clearly than i do that your men were the backbone of the defence during the day's long fighting but sickness carried off far more than rifle or cannon the imperial light horse who came to ladysmith four hundred and seventy-five strong were now reduced to a hundred and fifty the devons from nine eighty four had gone down to four hundred and eighty as majuba day was coming near the messages brought by the runners became more hopeful all going well conge is surrounded but time after time came the news of buller's failure at the tugela and with every piece of ill news came reduced rations at ladysmith the artillery horses were nearly all eaten the cavalry horses too those that remained were too weak even to raise a trot would buller ever cut his way through the garrison were beginning to despond if they had to fight a fierce battle again like that at caesar's camp a few weeks ago when the pick of the boer forces tried to take it by storm would they not reel and faint for very want of food then when all looked dark and the far-off sound of buller's guns seemed to be dying away in another failure something happened men on outpost duty upon the hills round ladysmith saw what seemed to them to be a long white snake crawling over the veldt officers seized their glasses and started with an ejaculation of surprise for what they saw was a long sinuous line of white tilted wagons it's the boers coming away from the tugela by jove it's a great trek yes the enemy were in full retreat at last buller had hammered them in so many places that now at last he had succeeded there they came wagon after wagon in endless succession as it seemed verily it was a retreat of an army for there were thousands of horsemen too riding at a hand gallop singly or in clusters a continuous stream of moving figures coming round the corner of end hill and then riding north behind telegraph hill they were seeking their railway base but though they rode fast in retreat there was no confusion the boers know how to trek and they do it well oh that we had had some horses good strong horses to gallop our guns in their direction but the horses were all either eaten or too weak to trot those who looked to bulwana hill saw a strange black tripod being erected above the big boar gun they were going to take the gun away the gunners of the powerful saw the tripod too they set to work to try and prevent that work from being accomplished both the four point sevens were in action and made the red earth fly near the boar redoubt the third shell burst upon the summit of the hill the many clusters of men who were watching waited breathlessly for the white smoke to clear away and when it cleared there was no tripod to be seen then an exultant shout rose up from hillside and from spruit some in their excitement danced and sang and shook hands and laughed they were weak for want of food and had not the usual english restraint then a great hailstorm came drifting by and there was a rush into the town to tell the glad news what a babel of talk there was at dinner that evening why some of the officers were so hopeful now that they ventured to predict that by to-morrow some of buller's men would be in ladysmith the dinner of horse-flesh was progressing merrily when all at once a strange clattering of shoes outside awoke attention they listened in the mess-room and heard eager voices cries of men and boys as they hurried past one went to the window and shouted what's the row buller's troopers are in sight they have been seen riding across the flats what then they all jumped up and the youngest and strongest fared forth with the hurrying crowd towards the nearest river drift on reaching this they saw across the river and the flat ground beyond riding down a little ridge a column of horsemen trotting towards them horsemen at full trot then they could not be any of their men for their horses could not trot to save their lives the evening sun shone upon their full kit and no one could doubt that it was the relief column at last god be thanked now they had pulled up and were welcomed by some officers of sir george white's staff meanwhile the motley crowd grew at first too dazed to cheer or shout but rather moist about the eyes 
Malays were there in their red fezes, coolies in many-colored turbans, and white-clad Indians, dooley bearers, grinning a silent welcome. But the most excited and the noisiest in all that throng were the Kaffir boys and Zulus, the Basutos and Bechuanas. They felt no cold reserve strangle their expression of delight, but danced and shouted and leapt like madmen, showing gleaming white teeth and sparkling eyes. As they drew near the town, they met many of the sick and wounded who had hobbled out in their great joy to receive the relievers, and who tried to wave their caps and say hurrah with the rest, a piteous sight of wan faces and poor shrunk shanks. And the men of the relief column, so brown and well they looked, were feeling in their pockets for tobacco to distribute round, for the spectacle they saw of white-faced, feeble-kneed invalids smote them to the heart. They had never realized until at this moment all that the defenders of Ladysmith had suffered for England. They rode in slowly, two by two, Dundonald and Goff and Mackenzie of Natal at the head of the column all through the main street they rode nodding to a friend here and a friend there for the imperial light horse had many friends in ladysmith there were wild cheers half choked by emotion and the little ones were hoisted on shoulder to be able to see the strong men who had come to save them then in the twilight came sir george white and his staff to welcome the rescue party as the leaders shook hands the excitement and joy of relief broke forth again men bit their lips as if nothing was happening but women and children cried and laughed and cried again all in their heart many in their voices were thanking god for this timely deliverance and then they fell to and cheered sir george white just then his patient heroism and kindly grip of power appealed to them and some who had not wept before cried now when they looked on the old soldier sitting so erect and proud in his saddle with all the heavy cloud of care suddenly removed from his brow and the light of joy and gratitude shining through wet eyes twice ay thrice he tried to speak but the tears were in his throat and he could not utter his thoughts then the cheers came again and gave him time to pull himself together he lifted his bowed head and thanked them for their loyal help soldiers and civilians alike and then finished by one solemn phrase that touched all hearts thank god we kept the old flag flying why the very zulus caught the enthusiasm and leapt high into the air waving bare arms aloft and shouting the old war cry of setawayo and his savage impis that night there were long stories to be told in the camp of the relief column mr winston spencer churchill m p wrote his story down of how they rode into ladysmith never shall i forget that ride the evening was deliciously cool my horse was strong and fresh for i had changed him at midday the ground was rough with many stones but we cared little for that onward wildly recklessly up and down hill over the boulders through the scrub we turned the shoulder of a hill and there before us lay the tin houses and dark trees we had come so far to see and save the british guns on caesar's camp were firing steadily in spite of the twilight what was happening never mind we were nearly through the dangerous ground now we were all on the flat brigadier staff and troops let their horses go we raced through the thorn bushes by intombe spreet suddenly there was a challenge halt who goes there the ladysmith relief column and thereat from out of trenches and rifle pits artfully concealed in the scrub a score of tattered men came running cheering feebly and some were crying in the half-light they looked ghastly pale and thin but the tall strong colonial horsemen standing up in their stirrups raised a loud resounding cheer for then we knew we had reached the ladysmith picket line one word more on sir ian hamilton one of the greatest of our soldiers it was he who held command on caesar's hill during those desperate seventeen hours of fighting spare tall quiet smiling he had the masterful manner of the born soldier who fights and makes no fuss about it and draws the soldiers after him in the forlornest of hopes by the magic of his sympathy and valor 
valor without sympathy ability without the devotion of your men can do little but when both are united steel and lead cannot prevail against them end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the romance of modern sieges by edward chiliad this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six siege of port arthur nineteen o four port arthur its hotel life stersel not popular fleet surprised shelled at twelve miles japanese pickets make a mistake wounded cannot be brought in polite even under the knife the etiquette of the bath the unknown death Kondrashenko, the real hero, the white flag at last, Nogi, the modest, Banzai, effect of good news on the wounded, the fleet sink with alacrity. Port Arthur consists of a small landlocked harbor surrounded by hills. As you sail into the harbor, you have on your right the Admiralty depots, dock basin, and dockyard, sheltered by Golden Hill. Next, the waterfront, or commercial quarter, on the left the tiger's tail a sand spit which narrows the entrance behind which the torpedo boats lie moored the new town lies south of signal hill on a plateau rising to the west all round the town were hill forts elaborately fortified the hotels were like the houses very primitive the best was a one-storied building containing about twenty rooms each room being furnished with a camp bedstead and no bedding one deal table and one chair sometimes if you swore hard at the chinese coolie you could get a small basin of water and a jug there was a permanent circus a chinese theatre music halls and grob shops a band played on summer evenings general stersel the military commander was not loved by soldier or citizen he was very strict and during the war became despotic they say he once struck a civilian across the face with his riding whip because the man had not noticed and saluted him as he passed his soldiers dreaded him and would slink away at his appearing some such words as these would come from him on seeing a sentry who are you where do you come from when did you join why are you so dirty take off your boots and let me inspect your foot rags oh got an extra pair on your kit show them at once go and wash your face though it was known that war between russia and japan was imminent the officers and men of both navy and army took little heed but relied on the strength of their fortress its fleet and batteries what could the little yellow monkeys do against russia well on the seventh of february invitations were sent out for a great reception at the residence of the port admiral for it was the name day of his wife and daughter officers of all grades flocked thither from the forts and the ships after the reception followed a dance very enjoyable gay and delightful it was midnight and many were down by the water's edge waiting for gig and pinnace a dull sound echoed through the streets that night dear me what is that i wonder oh only naval manoeuvres sir we sailors must be practising a bit you know in case the japs come then there was a laugh they don't dare to come under our guns but they had come in their torpedo boats the brave sailors of the rising sun were quietly steaming round the harbour launching a deadly torpedo at battleship and cruiser next morning when the russians went down to see what was going on they found the retvisan nose down and heeling over the tsarevich settling down by the stern and with a pretty list to starboard other vessels looking very uncomfortable and a long way off near the horizon some black specks that actually had the cheek to bombard port arthur why yes as the curious citizen came to the boat he was so astonished that he forgot to run crates and sacks had been hurled about double glass windows all smashed and what was that big hole on the quay big enough to hold an omnibus and four horses good gracious you don't mean to say that those specks twelve miles away have done all this come sir let us seek shelter in the stone quarries and the russian batteries on golden hill they were returning the fire from ten-inch guns but the japanese possessed thirteen-inch guns and were outside striking distance a party of ladies and gentlemen had gone to the terrace before the mayor's house to see the pretty sight 
it is not often you can see such a sight a shell fell just below them they scattered and went to bed what was it like oh my dear a noise like a big rocket a blaze a bang an awful clatter all around as the glass breaks and falls you are dazed you see yellow smoke you smell something nasty you shake you run run yes they all ran away from port arthur all who could merchants tradesmen coolies all went by train or boat then there were no bakers or butchers no servants until the russian troops were ordered to take the vacant places if the japanese had only known they might have taken port arthur that night of the torpedo attack but they left the russians sixteen days of quiet to recover from their panic and to repair their ships then it was more difficult the hole in the retvisen was forty feet long and twenty feet in depth seven compartments were full of water and many dead bodies floated in them but beached and waterlogged as she was she used her guns with effect many times during the siege so difficult is it to destroy a battleship unless you can sink her in deep water it was not long before all foreigners newspaper correspondents or candid friends were ordered out of port arthur so we have to rely on the evidence of those who witnessed the siege from the japanese side even they did not at first find their freedom to see and pass from one hill to another very secure one night two of them tried to get to the front under cover of the darkness they soon met a japanese officer who reined in and asked where they were going one of them could speak japanese and replied that they were looking for their camp so he let them go but what if they stumbled upon the japanese outpost and were shot at as russians they must be very wary in the starlight they saw a small hill in front of them which they made for hoping to see or hear more of the great fight which sounded louder as they walked a roar of rifles broken by the rattle of machine-guns as they climbed one of them said he saw a trench near the top of the hill and men sitting near it they hesitated but finally made up their minds to risk it and advanced boldly whistling carelessly as they went the japanese were all looking out in front and did not at first notice the newcomers who approached from behind then suddenly the thought came we are being taken in flank by the russians the entire picket started to their feet many of them had been fast asleep and being roused to hear the noise of heavy firing they called out ruskies one englishman tried to seize a japanese by the hand to show he was a friend but his intention failed for both of them rolled into the trench the other threw himself flat on the ground and called out in japanese english friends when at last the japanese discovered their mistake they were all smiles and apologies and please go to the front sir the japanese made great mistakes at first they lost many thousands by attacking in front hills and forts scientifically fortified they were trying to do what was impossible some years before they had captured port arthur from the chinese speedily and easily by a fierce assault they had then been compelled by russia france and germany to give up their fair prize of victory afterwards russia had seized port arthur and manchuria so honor and revenge both spurred on the japanese to retake it from the russians the war became most cruel and sanguinary after one night attack the japanese left seven thousand dead and wounded on the hillside they could not fetch them in though they were within call some few crawled back to their friends at night many lay out for days being fed by biscuits and balls of rice thrown from the japanese trenches the japanese were fed almost entirely on rice a naval surgeon tells a story which explains the conduct of the japanese when suffering intense pain he says when the battleship hatsur was sunk in may a sailor was laid on the operating table who had a piece of shell two and a half inches long bedded in his right thigh i offered him a cigar as he came in which he eagerly took but the surgeon told him not to smoke it just then his smaller injuries were first attended to and then the surgeon turned to the severe wound in the man's thigh in order to pull out the piece of steel still embedded in the limb he was obliged to pass his hand into the wound which was deep enough to hide it as far as the wrist during this painful operation the sailor never spoke or winced 
but kept trying to reach the breast pocket of his coat at length the surgeon irritated by his fidgety manner asked what are you doing why can't you keep quiet the sailor replied i want to give that english gentleman a cigarette in exchange for the cigar he kindly gave me even in the throes of that agony the japanese sailor could not forget his politeness and gratitude they are a curious mixture of opposites these japanese one day facing machine-guns like fiends incarnate or giving their bodies to be used as a human ladder in attempt to escalade a fort the next day sucking sweetmeats like little boys you come upon some groups by a creek they are laughing and playing practical jokes as they sharpen up their bayonets with busy innocent faces making ready for the great assault at dawn to-morrow a few yards further on you find them in all states of undress their underwear fluttering to the breeze some of them sitting on the stones and tubbing with real soap you ask them why so busy this afternoon they smile and nod their heads towards port arthur and one who speaks english explains that they had been taught at school this proverb japanese fight like gentlemen and if they are found dead on the field they will be found like gentlemen clean and comely there were so many forms of death in this siege plurima mortis imago as virgil says from the speedy bullet to the common shell shrapnel and pom-pom but besides these common inventions there were mines that exploded under their feet as they walked hand grenades thrown in their faces as they approached the forts there were pits filled with petroleum ready to be lit by an electric wire and poisonous gases to be flung from wide-mouthed mortars but the one which spread terror even amongst the bravest was what they called the unknown death it was said that during the early attacks in august one whole line of infantry which was rushing to the assault had fallen dead side by side and that no wounds had been found on them at last it was discovered the russian chief electrician had ordered a live wire to be placed among the ordinary wire entanglements furnished with a current strong enough to kill any one who touched it of course it was liable to be destroyed by shell or cannon fire but in many cases it proved fatal and always made the attackers nervous the russians had such steel wire entanglements placed at the foot of all their positions and where success depended on the dash and speed of the infantry they succeeded in stopping them and exposing them to a heavy fire as a rule volunteers went out at night with strong wire nippers and cut the strands or they set fire to the wooden posts and let them come to the ground together sometimes in a fierce charge the sappers used to lie down beneath the wires pretending to be dead and choose a moment for using their nippers some even in their desperate efforts to get through would seize the wire between their teeth and try and bite it through the man among the russians who was the mainspring of the defence was general kondrashenko he was an eminent engineer very popular with the men one of the bravest and most scientific of the russian officers on the fifteenth of december the general and his staff were sitting inside north kaikwansan fort in the concrete barrack just underneath the spot where a shell had made a hole in the roof this had been repaired and they had come to see if it had been well done as luck would have it a second twenty-eight centimetre shell came through the same place and burst inside the barrack killing the gallant kondrashenko and eight other officers who were with him this was the gravest blow that port arthur could have suffered for this man was the spirit of resistance personified after his death stersel began to seek for excuses to surrender he called a council of war and proposed that as the japanese had taken so many forts and sunk their warships terms of surrender should be proposed almost every one was opposed to it and some officers were so disgusted that they privately suggested kidnapping stersel and locking him up the japanese policy of mining and firing mine underneath the redoubts had succeeded so often that the russians had got into a nervous state on the first of january the fort of wantai was rushed and captured mountain guns and quick firers were sent up to help in holding the ground ammunition was sent forward everything made ready to rush the whole of the eastern defences when to the astonishment of all 
from general to private a white flag was seen fluttering over the valley the news spread like wildfire that stersel wished to capitulate could it be possible at nine a m on the following morning the second of january a little group of foreign pressmen assembled as usual in the small room provided for them at headquarters they discussed the white flag incident but they remembered that stersel had said that he would die in the last ditch so it did not seem probable captain zasuhara whose duty it was to inform them of what was going on was late in appearing and when the door opened it was not the captain but an orderly who entered carrying a tray on which was a bottle of liqueur brandy and several glasses something strange must be going to happen when a japanese officer begins to drink liqueur so early a few moments later captain zasuhara came in gentlemen general stersel has capitulated port arthur has surrendered banzai they all joined in the shout banzai which means live forever and then gave three lusty saxon cheers which brought out general nogi the commander-in-chief he who for so many months had borne the grave responsibility of sending so many thousands to their death he who had lost both his sons before port arthur and tried so hard to conceal his grief now beamed with joy at the sudden relief and the lines that used to seam his forehead were smoothed out and almost invisible a grand gentleman was nogi gentle and polite and kind to all who could have grudged him this triumph after so much sorrow and disappointment he offered his hand received their congratulations with dignity and said with an undercurrent of sadness and a voice as soft as a woman's i thank you all for staying with me through the dark days of disappointment and all the sorrowful hours of this terrible siege the proud spirit of the samurai soldier seemed blended with the gentle feeling of the buddhist it was a touching sight to have seen and how the news stirred the troops men broke into snatches of song then shouted and yelled banzai until they choked in the field hospitals the wounded trying to rise from their canvas stretchers joined in the cheering with thin weak voices at night wood fires were lit all around the hills and many of the russian garrison left their dismal forts and came down to sip sake rice wine and after spending a night of carousal with their late enemies the big burly foemen of the north were glad to be helped homewards by their polite hosts who bowed on leaving them and hoped they would not suffer from the after-effects of japanese hospitality astonishing too was the effect of the good news on the wounded desperately wounded men crawled over the stony hills and walked to the hospitals without aid if you said to one such you are badly hurt let me give you an arm he smiled proudly and said with a salute no no port arthur has fallen one man who had been shot in the head and whose right arm had been smashed to pieces by a shell walked to the dressing station had his arm amputated and his head dressed and then walked two miles further to the field hospital the news was too good for him to think of his own pain another man had a bullet through his chest he walked two miles to the hospital there he coolly asked the surgeon if he thought he might live the surgeon though he knew the man's case was hopeless said oh yes but after a pause if you have any letter you wish written do it at once the soldier replied all i desire is that a letter should be written to my mother no sooner had he uttered these words than he fell dead on the spot it reminds one of a young lieutenant in browning's poem who had ridden with dispatches to napoleon why my boy you are wounded nay sire i am killed in the harbour at port arthur there were riding at anchor five battleships and two cruisers on the tenth of august they had gone out to meet admiral togo and had returned next day badly damaged by the first of september they had been repaired but on november the twenty seventh began a tremendous battle for the possession of two o three metre hill on the fifth of december that hill was taken at a fearful cost of lives and a japanese naval lieutenant wormed his way into the shallow trench and by help of his nautical instruments was able to take observations and give the correct direction and distance to the artillery commander who at once trained howitzers on the fleet all the ships were sunk by the sixth of december 
with the exception of the sevastopol which steamed out under captain von essen and anchored under the batteries of tiger's tail this brave officer tried to protect his ship by a wooden boom and by torpedo nets for three nights he was attacked by japanese boats and torpedoes and inflicted great damage on them at last the boom was pierced and the ship's steering gear ruined by a torpedo the sevastopol showed signs of settling down so that night steam was got up for the last time and the gallant commander with a few picked men took her out into deep water opened the sluice cocks and then taking to his launch pulled away a bit and watched the great battleship settle down stern first in the dim and misty moonlight it was only right that the pluck of this russian captain should be remembered when we think of the poor defence made by the russian navy as for the rest of the fleet the battleships and cruisers were huddled together with a strong list and their upper works destroyed they have since been raised and repaired and belong to the mikado the siege of port arthur cost general nogi's army eighty nine thousand men in killed wounded and sick of these ten thousand were officers the japanese have read a great lesson in patriotism and sense of duty to the whole world to the courtly and feudal chivalry of their old-world samurai or noble they have added the foresight and inventive genius of the european they have suddenly sprung into the front rank of civilized nations and no one can forecast the greatness of their future from the siege of port arthur by e eshmond bartlett by kind permission of measures w blackwood and sons end of chapter twenty six end of the romance of modern sieges by edward gilliatt